It's more than a network. It's a destination for anyone and everyone who's game. It plays a major part in the video game world. You have your programming and your design, which is one third. You have your visual, animation, motion capture, that's one third. And you have your audio, which is one third. And has grown, just like the industry that leads it. Back then, when I was growing up, it was all about bleeps and bloops. When the music was doo 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 doo. Originally, with video games, it was so limited by what the systems can do. Just like, God, it's almost painful to listen to some of the music they put in those early Atari games. But the people who create it often go unrecognized. I know the games and I know the music, but again, the composer name. And now Icons gives credit where credit is due. This is the story behind the magic of music and gaming. of big hair and Reaganomics. Music and gaming was little more than beeps and boops. But despite these technical limitations, a small group of talented music makers began to make their mark on the gaming world. Two of these pioneers were Clint Bajakian and George Sanger, AKA The Fat Man. But like many others, they had humble beginnings. The Fat Man, George Sanger, was a promising physics engineering major in a small liberal arts college in California. There was the potential for him to do something really great in the scientific world, but uh, he got distracted by a couple of things. Number one is that the band was doing very well, you know, and the promise of being a rock star seemed very nice. I marched in a marching band at my uh, elementary school in Concord, Massachusetts. Then I moved on to guitar, and I just started to play, you know, rock and roll and folk and everything. These two aspiring musicians become inspired by greatness. I had this idea that the, the Beatles just sort of stood out above everything else in my life. And I thought, what is it about them that makes them so great? And how can I capture that and emulate it and spread that kind of goodness to people? I then discovered that I really loved classical music, mostly through Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And it was then that I decided to get formal with a guitar. I took classical guitar at the New England Conservatory, also met majored in music theory, and then finally got my master's in composition at the University of Michigan. It seemed like in normal music, ow, that all the trees had been cut down in that forest, you know what I mean? So I decided I, nonetheless, I'd dedicate myself to my band because that seemed like the thing to do, and, and my grades kind of fell off a little bit in the physics area. And uh, I got myself a music major. Fate steps in right around graduation. I was just finishing up my master's degree at the University of Michigan, about to step off into the real world, and I got a phone call from an old friend of mine, Michael Land, who had answered an ad in a newspaper in the San Francisco Bay Area for a composer and a programmer, and he could do both. It turned out to be, at that time, Lucasfilm Games Division. He got the job as the one-man sound department, and very quickly, 1991, the need for full-length scores uh, came into being, and he gave me a call, and I moved out to the Bay Area uh, in a heartbeat. Soon after, Clint is working on his first game. It was Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis with Hal Barwood. As well as The Secret of Monkey Island with Ron Gilbert. And the fat man begins to make a name for himself. After college ended, the band broke up. And 
and there I was, promising smart guy, should have had a career, and I got nothing but the strange admiration of games, which seemed like rock and roll used to be. By a stroke of luck, uh, a friend of my brother was in the Intellivision company, and I offered to empty his waste baskets for free if he'd let me into the game business somehow. He said, well, you're a musician, aren't you? And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not really a musician. He said, well, write a tune for this game, and I did. Uh, I rose and rose. I was about the only person in the business for many years. He puts together an ensemble of musicians called Team Fat, and together they begin to make musical history. It was a game called Wing Commander. The producer, Chris Roberts, said, can you do something that's sort of like Star Wars and sort of like Star Trek the movie? But it was unquestionably not just a breakthrough game for having introduced this idea of cinematics in a way that no one had experienced before. It also introduced the idea of orchestral soundtracks in a way that no one had approached before. The fat man started all out. I mean, he was the one who started us in this industry. So you, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta tip your hat. Meanwhile, Clint Bajakian makes some of the most memorable music and gaming at LucasArts. It was extremely exciting. When I first started out, I was with Michael Land and Peter McConnell. Michael Land is known for The Dig, the Monkey Island scores in the beginning. Peter McConnell composed Full Throttle. And he composed Grim Fandango. And he has a hand in creating a groundbreaking interactive music engine called iMuse. Michael and Peter uh, really authored it, but I was on the uh, fringes as, uh, as a user and giving them advice. And the iMuse system was patented with the government. <laughs> it was touted as being the only really hot interactive sound and music system in the industry at the time. I'm surprised no one ever really caught on to this in a big way. But the idea that LucasArts had, whereas as you're playing the game, the music shifts depending on how you're doing within the game and the events that are taking place. It won't do anything. And that was just a phenomenal breakthrough, a phenomenal idea. Houston gives us the go-ahead. Say my boss. Do it. With the arrival of CD-ROM games, George Sanger and Team Fat become trailblazers once again with the seventh guest. Once we've gotten to the CD era, though, you've really seen that people started putting a lot more time and effort and energy into this, going in and recording not only synthesizers, but bands, in some cases, orchestras. It was at a time that games hadn't really experienced a lot of audio experimentation yet either. And so the, the game developers left me alone, let me do something fairly brave with the music. Now we're seeing especially that using a full-on orchestra as opposed to MIDI, it's more the standard. People aren't afraid to do it anymore. They're putting in the time and effort and money to do it because games have become a production on par with movies. The music composed by the fat man and Clint Pajakian leads gaming to another level. That's the stuff that really set the tone for the idea that we were going to have these real scores, these real arrangements, and this real lush feeling behind a game. And while they would never guess it, these two pioneers will help pave the road for a new batch of game music makers. <laughs> Good shooting, mister. The Fat Man and Clint Pajakian, two very different music makers, have opened the door for followers. Like Tommy Tallarico, whose musical ambitions have him leaving his home in Springfield, Massachusetts. When I turned 21, I decided I'm going to go up to California. You know, I'm going to do the whole, you know, be a rock star, move to Hollywood thing. So I literally got my car, packed up, didn't have any money, didn't have a place to stay, didn't know anyone, nothing. Just, just wanted to be a musician. I drove all the way across country. I showed up in Hollywood. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world in Japan, another future music maker gets his first exposure to some American tunes. When I was junior high, I always listened to uh, Led Zeppelin. <laughs> And in that high school, uh, I was addicted with listening to the contemporary jazz and punk and progressive work together. So uh, it was very mixed in various kinds of generations, like 70s or 60s. 
and the European music, American music, Japanese music, so on. Uh, it's all mixed together. But things for Tommy in Hollywood aren't so glamorous. So I picked up a newspaper and I saw a job for selling keyboards at a, at a, a guitar center, a national, uh, national you know, music chain. And I said, well, I can do that, I guess. I don't know. I, I went there and I got the job that same day. I was homeless at the time. I was sleeping on the beach. I didn't have any money. Um, and they said, you start tomorrow. So I started tomorrow. But an amazing stroke of luck changes his life forever. Next day, I come in, the very first person who walked in, I was wearing a video game t-shirt that day. Uh, first person who walked in happened to be a producer at uh, Virgin, uh, who, who Virgin Records and Virgin Airlines, and they were starting a new video game company. And they said, hey, we're looking to uh, hire people uh, for video games. And just like that, Tommy gets his first job in the gaming industry. But it doesn't have anything to do with music. Now, I was originally hired as a games tester because they didn't need a music thing because they were just starting out. And I said, look, whenever you, you, whenever you need music, let me know. I'll do it for free. If you don't like it, don't use it, don't pay me, don't, whatever. I'll do it for free. And Tommy's persistence soon pays off. I'd bug him every single day. And uh, finally, they gave me a shot to do music for a game called Prince of Persia. And I learned everything I could. And I sat down with the programmer. I didn't know anything, but I just I knew music. And uh, we implemented it. And the rest is history, as they would say. Back in Japan, Masaya begins a career of his own. I was a signed artist with Sony Music. I was composing music by using computer. And I have the partner female singer and just a two people band. But the regular musician gets an itch. I wanted to do uh, much more something. So um, game will be uh, uh, very easy to uh, combine the various kind of impression together. So I moved to the game industry. Back in America, Tommy begins to gain notoriety. And a big part of that is due to an earthworm named... So that was really fun. And I'd come up with the voicings, the sound effects, and music was kind of wacky and zany. Earthworm Jim is so successful that a sequel is made. Around the same time, Masiya gets a letter that will jumpstart his music career. I got a letter from Vice President of the Sony Computer Japan. In the letter was, I want to make something on the PlayStation. That's it. How can I do that? And development of a strange new PlayStation game begins in secret. And during the development of the proper one, almost no one didn't know about that. You gotta do what? I gotta believe! And the very end of the development, still the many people didn't think this is a game. Kick. Kick. Punch. Punch. Parappa the Rapper is released for the PlayStation in 1996. And the response in Japan is incredible. A game like Parappa the Rapper, it's perhaps the first truly musical video game. It's almost like a hip-hop Moulin Rouge sort of thing, you know what I mean? Where the, the music is so in there and it seriously enhances the gameplay. Some catchy tunes are a huge part of Parappa's success. All right, we're here, just sitting in the car. I want you to show me if you can get far. They found a way to take the music and make the music so much a part of the game that the fact that it was great music really enhanced the gameplay. That's because you just got your license. Woo and Tommy Tallarico sets another benchmark. I was the first musician to ever do a video game soundtrack album. In 1994, I had a worldwide record release on Capitol Records called Tommy Tellerico's Greatest Hits Volume 1. But some people aren't impressed. I think the gamers, if they like the music, they'll listen to it when they play the game. I don't think you're going to see much of an urge for people to be driving around in the car, you know, uh, blasting the soundtrack, you know, to a Final Fantasy or Earthworm Jim. You know, I just don't think it's going to happen. Tommy isn't deterred. The last uh, CD soundtrack I did was for the James Bond game, Tomorrow Never Dies. And this is cool, you know, that, that's, that's really neat.
With the success of people like Clint Bajakian and Tommy Tallarico, a whole new generation of music makers begin appearing, and a bit of Hollywood influence will soon make its way into gaming. As the quality of music and gaming grows, Hollywood begins to take notice. Soon, music makers from Tinseltown try their hand at making music for a different medium. One day I was at E3, and uh, I was looking at a game that had a very nice John Williams-like score. And uh, I wasn't wearing the outfit. I asked the guy at the booth, I said, wow, I said, who wrote that music? And he said, well, I probably shouldn't tell you this because it's a secret, but John Williams wrote that music. I said, whoa, man. Perhaps one of the most active Hollywood musicians to cross over is Scott Gershon. I started originally doing cartoons. I did Defenders of the Earth, uh, I did Transformers, G.I. Joe. Then I uh, made my way into television, a TV show called Beauty and the Beast. I've been very fortunate, I think, in my life to um, work on a variety of shows. Um, I've done a lot of work with Oliver Stone. Uh, I really liked working, um, born, born on the 4th of July was special to me. Uh, so was JFK. It was just a very interesting way of utilizing sound design in a musical fashion and being able to have emotional impact with it. Uh, it was also fun working with John Williams. Scott's first video game project is a remake of a classic. My first game was Pitfall Harry, the mind adventure with uh, Activision. And he has an easy time translating his skills from TV and film to games. The technology we always used in film were samplers and synthesizers. So when I saw a lot of the game consoles, to me they were just another synthesizer. So all of the memory constraints and everything else that we had to deal with was just par for the course. And I don't know, I've always been a fan of games. And we just kind of grew it from there. And like many others before him, he pushes the envelope. With Pitfall, when I saw the engine, I said, great, could we do interactive music? I want to be able to turn tracks on and off. I want to do this, I want to do that. And they're all looking going, well, yeah, the box can do it, but we don't have the software. I said, great, can we make it? Can we write the software? Yay, you know, and, and um, we did. But Hollywood hotshots aren't the only people getting involved. A new breed of young composers blaze their own trails. Stephen Rippey and Kevin McMullen's work on Age of Mythology from Ensemble Studios is a great example of modern sound design and music in gaming. We started off the project knowing that we wanted to build up our libraries as much as we could. Um, we took trips to the zoo, some water parks, and around the office with mics and tape recorders, and we hit things, and we hit each other, and we yelled and screamed. And uh, at the end of the day, we have what we hope sounds like a bunch of Minotaurs and Pegasi. In this game, we've integrated a lot of uh, live instrumentation. Bring them in and incorporate them into the music. And this music system is also a dynamic music system. So while you're playing the game, uh, it, it changes moods based on what's going on. Whether there's a lot of action or if you've had a big loss, the music seamlessly uh, mixes down to sort of a mellow mix version, and then if there's a big battle, the battle music cuts in, and it's a big orchestral kind of thing. Scott's work is good, and the work keeps coming in. We've done a lot. One of the things was I was the lead designer of Soundlux, and created Soundlux DMG. I'm the founder of it. The things we've done is Rainbow Six. Man down. Need some backup now. We've done all the quakes been able to do uh, Undying. You've been doing uh, McWarrior, too. And on and on and on. But Scott enjoys the anonymity and never forgets that it's all about the games. When somebody sees one of my projects, whether it's a game or a movie, I actually don't want them to be concerned who I am. I don't want people to know who I am. Because I want them to enjoy the movie or the game. They shouldn't be going, wow, what great music, what great sound design. Because <laughs> if they do that, they're not enjoying it. I'm taking them out of that. Music and games has made progress in leaps and bounds, and nobody forgets how it all began. Back then, when I was growing up, it was all about bleeps and bloops. When the music was doo 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 doo. 
You know, originally with video games, it was so limited by what the systems can do. It's just like, God, it's almost painful to listen to some of the music they put in those early Atari games. You know, these kind of annoying, repetitive, catchy sometimes tunes. It was the kind of thing, if you turned it up too loud, you felt like your speaker was going to explode. They're putting out soundtrack albums, and it's been a funny progression. Yeah. I think we're at a great stage in video games right now, and things are only going to get better from here. And as far as the music goes, it's better than it's ever been before. And I'm sure the future holds more interesting twists and turns. And the industry is still evolving. It's a constant learning process, and you just get to expand and expand. I, I don't see how I will ever run out of new and exciting things to learn about music or sound or uh, the applications of those in, in a game. So hopefully we get to keep doing it for a while. It's so exciting to be in the video game industry right now. Uh, it's such a new industry, yet we're, we forge ahead every single day. It's an amazing industry. It's just been fun. I mean, the graphics have grown, the technology has grown. The ability for us to be more powerful with audio has expanded incredibly. And while things just keep getting better, the true trailblazers have a bit of advice for the next generation. The first thing I would do is uh, study an instrument. Uh, piano is a very good foundational instrument, but any instrument is, is important. Flute, uh, guitar, trumpet, drums. And keep an eye on the games industry. Play games, enjoy games, read the periodicals about games, and try to get to know people who create games. Because that's where the real war stories happen, that's where the real rubber hits the road. Okay, that's it. Good luck. Catch the anime series Last Exile starting tonight at midnight only on Anime Unleashed. Break out the honors. X Men Legends is one of the best co op games of the year. Game Informer declares it's the X Men game we've all been waiting for. X Men Legends rated teen. When am I supposed to add this? Snoop wants to know when to add the fabric softener. I don't know. Ask what's his name? Snoop use fabric softener. Snoop does his own laundry? That's hot. I wonder Snoop smells so good. Fabric softener, so that's how those hip hop guys get all the chicks. Now for a limited time, get the new sidekick too. Only $1.99. Everybody needs a sidekick. I guess you're just what I need. Just what I need. Wednesday and Thursday only at Circuit City. All CDs are on sale for just $9.99 or less. Choose from thousands of the hottest CDs, all on sale for just $9.99 or less Wednesday and Thursday only. And while you're there, be sure to pick up a Circuit City gift card, too. It's the perfect gift for everyone on your list. Last-minute shopping has never been easier. Hurry into Circuit City today. your job, bored with your friends, feel like you're stuck in a rut, sounds like you could use a dose of epic fantasy gaming. Gone is the workday drudgery of your office job. Now you're a wandering knight on never-ending quest. Say goodbye to the same old faces and say hello to witches and wizards who hold the key to adventure. And best of all, we'll have you home by dinner time. Your journey begins right now on Cheat. the video game how-to show that only pretends to pay attention to the rules. I'm Kristen Holt, and in this episode, we're leaving the everyday world behind. 
Whether you're a Hyrulean field hand unwillingly caught up in the battle against the Twilight Realm, or just some poor sap stuck in a castle full of monsters, we've got the cheats you need. Now mount your trusty steed and unsheath your sword. We're entering the world of oblivion. You just fought the Nine Spirits, and you received the quests for the relics. But where does a girl start her shopping? Shoes, of course. For the boots, you'll be heading north to the Shrine of Kynareth. Talk to Avita Vesnia. She'll give you a test and tell you to head to the Grove. And you must pass the test before you may be granted the boots. The Grove is just west of the Shrine. Once you arrive, a big, cute, fuzzy bear will appear. Aw, how adorable! Wait! Ah! Ah! Oh, so that was the test. Good thing I'm a lover, not a fighter. Proceed through the door and into the cave to claim your new boots. Next, we're shopping for a shield. Sir Henrik said the shield is being held in Fort Bulwark. It's like your typical fort, however, it's filled with conjurers who summon enemies. Your task is to fight and explore the whole dungeon, but there are three puzzles you need to solve. The first puzzle is fairly simple, but it requires you to listen closely. You'll see several layers of floor panels. As you step over each one, it makes a certain click. But one from each layer will sound different. All you have to do is step on the panel with a different click as you walk through the hall. The next puzzle happens after you release the prisoner. He'll then give you the clues. Now the knowledge I've gained may be of use to you. Move on and you'll eventually find a room with four statues. At the base of each statue, you'll find a switch. Play with the switches until each statue is facing the middle. Ta-da! Lights out, door opens, and you move on. The last puzzle is a bit more, well, puzzling. First, you'll see a chest in the middle, a switch, and eight statues. Step on the switch, and a statue will start glowing. Open the large chest in the middle, and you'll find an item. Grab the item and place it in one of the chests near the statues. Step on the switch again, and another statue glows. This time, the glow on the statue looks different. Doesn't that remind you of a helmet? Put the helmet in this chest. Now you get the trick. Once you've filled all the chests, the path will open, giving you access to the shield. Next on the shopping list are the gauntlets. They're in the northwest corner of the chapel in Coral. But when you try to pick them up, they're too heavy. Talk to Arldor and he'll tell you about Kellen. Now go talk to Kellen and he'll tell you about his suspicions concerning Arldor. I know there's something he's not telling. Speak with Arldor again and you'll learn that you need to pray at the altar. After praying, you'll be granted the spell Lay of Hands. Now cast it over Kellen and you'll be allowed to pick up the gauntlets. Last on the list is the sword. The quest begins back at the Priory. Lathon tells you that Sir Roderick has died and he must be avenged. He'll then give you the Greaves of the Crusader and will join you in your fight to kill the accomplice. Make your way to the Underpaw Cave and fight your way through the dungeon. Get your magic or silver gear ready because you'll encounter a lot of wraiths. After killing the Wraith of Lord Vlindril, you can retrieve the Sword of the Crusader. Now, head to the Chapel of Arche in Shaden Hall. The chapel is under attack and you'll have to defend it against Aurorans. After the Slaughter Fest, Pray at the altar to lift the curse from the sword. Woohoo! Your shopping list is now complete. And believe me, you want to make sure you remove the curse from that sword before you leave the temple. Because if you don't, you'll void the warranty and then you're stuck paying for any parts or service out of your own pocket. And if that wasn't enough excitement for you, it seems that Link is about to encounter the Hyrulean equivalent of a Bigfoot in the Snow Peak Ruins. Witnesses in Zora's domain claim that the beast from Snow Peak has been sighted in the village. After some investigation, you'll track the monster down and learn that he's not such a bad guy after all. His name is Yeddo, and he's been taking fish from Zora's domain to feed his sick wife. What's more, he has one of the mirror shards you're searching for and invites you to his home, the Snow Peak Ruins. Inside, you'll find his wife, Yetta, recovering by the fireplace. She explains that she got sick after they found the mirror. They've locked the bedroom door, so she gives you a map to find the key. Yetto is in the kitchen making soup. Use an empty bottle to scoop up the fishy broth, which heals two hearts. In the next room, you'll find an icy block puzzle. Push one of the blocks around the edges until it's in the notch near the bottom. Then push the other block around to slide it into the groove with the switch. 
Head through the next few rooms to reach the spot marked on your map. Destroy the icy monsters to access the chest and get the... Pumpkin? Yetta has you take the orange squash to her husband, who will then toss it into the soup. Refill your bottles and return to the sick gal. She apologizes, marks a new spot on your map, and opens a door to the courtyard. Dig up a buried key to unlock the door to the adjacent room. Use the lever on the wall to transfer a cannonball outside. Turn the cannon around and use a bomb and a cannonball to crush the icy creature blocking your path. In the cramped hallway beyond, you'll be ambushed by a knight swinging a wicked ball and chain. It's hard to get around the brute, and his only weak point is the tail poking out under his armor. Wait for him to throw his weapon and run behind him to attack. Defeat him, and his massive weapon will be yours. The ball and chain's main function is to break things. Blocks of ice, suits of armor, and valuable antique furniture are no match for the spiked steel ball. Head into the back room and break away the ice to claim the prize you've been waiting for, goat cheese. Wait a second, goat cheese? Where's the bedroom key? Go back to see Yetta. Hey, you're cute and all, but where's the key already? She thinks it over and asks you to give the cheese to Yetto. Fill your bottles with his hearty new brew and go back to the wife. She promises the key is upstairs and marks your map. Head upstairs and break through the damaged floor to find a piece of heart. Then go through the unlocked door and hit the chandelier with the ball and chain to cause it to swing. Use the swinging platform to jump across and get a key. Unlock the foyer's upper level and cross a series of chandeliers to find a second piece of heart. After that, head back to the west wing to solve a second block puzzle. Keep the wedge crate where it is and push the other two to the back. Then take the back block and circle around it again to hit the switch. When you reach the cannon on the upper level of the courtyard, aim it at the ice monster above the ladder on the east side of the building. Then go downstairs to collect a cannonball. Use the levers and cannons to transport the ball up to the balcony. Blast away the frozen baddie and climb the ladder he was guarding. You'll have a showdown with several knights in the chapel and earn a sausage in return. Oh, sorry, this time it's actually the bedroom key. Yetta will meet you outside and take you upstairs. As she dares to take one last look at the mirror, its power turns her into a crushing mass of ice called Blazetta. But don't worry, chip away the ice and this story will still have a happy ending. And speaking of happy, did you know the Cheat Sheet is back? Yep, just visit g4tv.com slash cheat sheet to unlock our database of more than 15,000 game tips. Now go get a sweater. Castlevania's up next after the break and it's gonna get drafty. But first, check out this quick cheat for Wii Sports. If you love your Wii Sports, but just want a little more flavor, then check out these quickies for tennis and baseball on the Nintendo Wii. Strike. When playing tennis, you can change the color of the court to the sweet blue court that's used in the tennis training mode. Just press and hold the two button at the warning screen after selecting characters. And when you're pitching during baseball, just press the two button and you'll throw a wicked underhand sidearm like Randy Johnson. Strike. Strike. Viewers agree, it's the show for everything you care about. We really do know what you want. Kevin is my role model. We have the internet. Olivia equals hot. Get ready to cough, bend over, and let me in your pants. When it comes to tech and gaming, they're definitely not noobs. $600 for a console and Sony can't kick me a $15 table? We're gonna bring you the latest news, oddities, and things that make you go, yeah. Attack of the show, tonight at seven, only on G4. Welcome back to Cheat's fantastical cabinet of mysteries. The year is 1944. The last battles of World War II are raging throughout Europe, but you've got other problems on your mind. Namely, the shenanigans of Bronner the Vampire and his creepy kids. They want to summon Dracula's castle and bring humankind to an end. Are you just gonna sit there and take that? Heck no! You'll hit him with everything you've got in Castlevania Portrait of Ruin. Whips and stones may break my bones, but Castlevania will never hurt me. Well, maybe a few times, but not anymore. 
Konami has brought back the classic gameplay we all know and love with updated abilities and scenarios in Castlevania Portrait of Ruin for the DS. The year is 1944, and the Belmont clan is history. This time, you'll be exploring Dracula's castle as Jonathan Morris and Charlotte Allen. The dual characters add a new strategy to the gameplay. You can fight alongside your partner and even switch characters mid-battle. You'll learn more team abilities throughout the game, like calling in your partner for a quick spell or using their shoulders for some extra height. Someone's gonna need a chiropractor. After a bit of sleuthing, you'll realize that some guy named Brawner is squatting in Dracula's castle with his two daughters. He plans to steal the castle's power while the Dark Lord remains in his eternal slumber. And he's a crafty devil. He has sealed the power into paintings all over the castle. Each painting works like a wormhole, transporting you to another twisted dimension of the artist's imagination. The deeper you get in the game, the more problem solving you'll have to do. Many enemies have weaknesses to certain weapons or spells, so calling upon your partner will come in handy. One such enemy is the boss at the end of the Sandy Grave level, Cleopatra. This historical beauty has a spell that will cause any man to do her bidding, so that means Jonathan is out of the picture for this fight. Before you enter, make sure you equip Charlotte with the Tome of Arms, Gale Force Magic, and the strongest clothing and accessories you have. You can try to switch from Jonathan to Charlotte mid-fight whenever Cleo casts her charm spell, but we took the safer route and let the ladies duke it out. Listen closely and keep an eye on Cleopatra so you can avoid her attacks. She'll wind up before she takes a swing at you with her cape, so get ready to hop over it. When she says, take this, she'll cast a wind spell with her staff. You can easily avoid this with a double jump. When she jumps backwards and laughs, she'll shoot out some electric green magic. So just back up a bit and wait for her to head back in your direction. A good chance to get a few hits in is when she casts her temptation spell. Since Charlotte is immune to this, it gives you an opportunity to land two or three good attacks. I guess Charlotte doesn't swing that way. Take this! Keep at her with your Tome of Arms and Gale Force spell, and Cleopatra will finally return to the dust from whence she came. Now, where are all those zombie maids? All right, I killed them. Oops. Now you can watch your favorite episodes of Cheat wherever and whenever you like. Point your browser to g4tv.com slash podcast for clips of this and other G4 shows. Get ready for the Battle of Argorok when Cheat returns, but first, here's a quick cheat for Guitar Hero 2. Looking for a little variety in your life? Check out Guitar Hero 2 for PlayStation 2 to light the place up. Enter this code at the main menu and the lead singer's head will be engulfed in flames for the set. I know you're thinking he looks like a knockoff Ghost Rider, but trust me, this game is far better than the movie. Hey Kaylee, and these are the year's top stories from the feed. It's official that Nintendo Wii is the year's biggest success story. With a total of 3.19 million consoles sold worldwide, it blew away next-gen competitors PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360. As if you aren't excited enough about the Transformers movie, hints of an alternate reality game can be seen in the new trailer. If you caught a glimpse of a website called Sector7.org, you're probably already immersed. PC Magazine has released their list of the top 10 most tech-savvy colleges. MIT was a surprising second, coming in just behind Villanova. And finally, the upcoming Xbox 360 game Crackdown features a pass for an early peek at the Halo 3 multiplayer beta. Well, that's all for now. Visit us on the web at g4tv.com slash the feed. It's the only news you need to know. I am Layla Kaylee, and you have just been fed. Welcome back to Cheat's fantasy Orama. You know when you're looking for that last missing shard of a magic artifact, and you find out it's being hoarded by a fire-breathing dragon? I hate it when that happens but we can get through this together. Here's how to defeat Argorok in The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. High above Hyrule is a city in the sky where the strange Uka people live. 
The home of these chicken body creatures is being ravaged by an armored dragon named Argorok, who also holds the final shard of the Mirror of Twilight. After locating a second claw shot, you'll climb the windy heights of this ruined city to find and slay the dragon. The battle with Argorok takes place on a grassy rooftop with four tall pillars. The dragon circles the building from a distance, coming close when it's ready to attack. He blows fire, swoops in to ram you, and flaps his wings in an attempt to blow you off the platform. Argorok shows few weaknesses, but you can hang him from his tail with the claw shot. The massive beast will shake off a tiny human-like Link, but by equipping the iron boots, you can tip the scales to your advantage. The weight of your boots will pull the dragon to the ground, dislodging some of his armor on impact. Argorok will then avoid your attacks by hovering high above the field. Use your claw shots to reach the top of the pillars where you can latch onto the tail again and drag the monster back to Earth. As the dragon shakes off his remaining armor, a storm rolls in, and the rain causes a ring of flying plants to sprout from the field. Return to the top of the pillars and use your claw shots to move from plant to plant, avoiding Argorok's jets of flames. Keep circling until the flames stop, then get behind him and target the jewel on his back with the claw shot. As you ride the back of the dragon, repeatedly slash at his weak point until he crashes to the ground. After taking a few of these beatings, Argorok will wise up to your strategy and alter his attack pattern to block your path. Watch his movements carefully and be ready to change directions. Get on his back one more time and you should be able to finish him. With the final piece of the mirror in hand, you can head back to the Gerudo Desert. You'll learn more about Midna's true identity and open the doorway to the Palace of Twilight. Hey, the cheat sheet is back! No, really, I wouldn't lie about something like this. Fine, don't believe me, I was about to tell you to just visit g4tv.com slash cheat sheet to unlock our treasure trove of more than 15,000 game cheats, but I guess you're not interested. <laughs> We're headed back into oblivion when cheat returns after the break, but first, check out this quick tip for Nintendo Wii players. The Nintendo Wii is full of fun little features besides its usual games. You can create Miis, shop online, and download games, chat, and even view photos from your digital camera. If you want to take full advantage of these, you need Nintendo's secret helper. When you put in an SD memory card to view your photos, go to the fun section and look out for a black cat. When you catch the cat, he gives you hints about your Wii. When America needs a hero. <gasps> when freedom stands alone. Let's join Special Agent Bob and Secret Agent Steve, two of the finest official unofficial splinter cells. You want to play Navy Seals? No. Come on, I'll be Charlie Sheen, and you can be whoever else was in that movie. I think Bill Paxton was in that movie. You can be him. I'm not playing Navy SEALs. And Bill Paxton was not in that movie. Dude! What? Can we just drop it? He wasn't in the movie. Jesus, did you really need to kill him? What? Hey look, Bill Paxton was in Navy SEALs. IMDB said... Hey! We're almost out of here, just down that tunnel. Which Navy SEAL are you? Well, I guess I'll be Bill Paxton. What? Steve? Steve, I'm coming! Steve! Stay tuned for the continuing adventures of Bob and Steve. Welcome back to Cheat's Greatest and Grooviest Fantasy Games Edition. If you thought simply acquiring all those artifacts in Knights of the Nine was fun, wait till you see what you get to do with them. You'll be so excited you just might spit meat out of your nose. <laughs> now that you've acquired all the relics from the Knights of the Nine, you're gonna have to put them to use. First, return to the Priory. Somebody's waiting for you this time. Lord Crusader, the Prophet is here. Head into the chapel and speak with the Prophet. He'll tell you the next task is to finish off Umaril. After speaking with the Prophet, turn around and accept your new posse. At this point, all your knights will head to Garlus Malastar, your final battleground. By the time you arrive, your knights are standing side by side waiting for you. Give them the go-ahead and watch their stuff. 
The first battle outside will be quick and decisive. Once inside, a group of Aurorans will immediately meet you. Quickly eliminate them and keep your comrades alive. You'll need all the help you can get. Once you're done, the knights will line up preparing for the next assault. Activate the switch in the center and rush to the large gate straight ahead. You'll quickly be met by a large group of Aurorans. After you've cleared the area, follow the marker and proceed to the next room. You will now see two gates. Your knights are standing at the ready. Activate the switch in the middle and your comrades will charge forward. A large group of Aurorans will start attacking, but sometimes it's better to just avoid fighting. While your knights engage the enemy, run through the room, then up the stairs to the glowing orb. Now quickly activate the orb. Hey, where is everyone? Time to move on. The end is near. Continue fighting until you see Umaril descending the stairs. Now you're gonna finish off his physical form. This is it, boys. After defeating Umaril's physical form, cast Blessing of Talos and you'll... Whoa, this is so trippy. There he is again. Die, you monster. Defeat Umaril and you'll fall from the sky, but miraculously end up back at the Priory surrounded by the nine ghosts. Walk outside and your knights will begin celebrating your survival. Hail the Lord Crusader! It's Miller time! Hail, hail, hail the Lord Crusader! The Lord Crusader is arisen! And that's all the cheat we have for you today. Thanks for watching. If you missed any of these tips, visit g4tv.com slash cheat. Or you can write to us at cheat at g4tv.com. Until next time, I'm Kristen Holt, and Cheat wants to wish you a happy holiday. Visit Xbox.com. The future of video games has arrived. We thought they'd never find us. We were wrong. No enemy has ever withstood our might. I need a weapon. There are those who said this day would never come. What are they to say now? Rated M for Mature. This week on G4, see Hoop's hottest stars as Sweat takes you to the 2004 NBA All-Star Game. You've got to see this. Then, with entry into the Hall of Champions on the line, Team Kaizen faces off against Team 1051 on Arena. And Filter takes you on a chocobo ride through the best games, bosses, and characters of Final Fantasy. Sweat, Monday at 10 p.m. Arena, Tuesday at 10 p.m. And Filter, Thursday at 10.30 p.m. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, there you guys are. Happy holidays. Didn't mean to invade your personal bubble. Oh, Jesus, sorry. Ah. Now watch them. Watch your foot. Uh, watch it, buddy. Doesn't mean. Oh, excuse me. Oh, now watch the back, man. Oh, that thing loaded. Oh, that's not me. Double went around upstairs. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. Happy Hulk! Previously, I'm Blister. This is Polybius. 
What do I feel like I'm getting set up? Just get a grip. Okay, you're, you're talking to yourself again. Polybius was a video game with a limited release back in the early 80s, but it was no regular video game. There are larger forces at work here, Mr. Sindelar. So it begins. My initial contact with Deep Trench set me off in search of something called the Manga House. As it turns out, Manga House is a store at the Irvine Spectrum in California. Something tells me I'm close. Something tells me this place is important. Something tells me I need a shower. Nothing suspicious here. Just a bunch of interesting artwork. Uh, can I help you? Have you ever heard of a video game called Polybius? Sounds familiar. Why? Anything suspicious about Spy Hunter 2 or Kill Switch? <sighs> Man, I don't know. Maybe I'm just stretching here. But I'm even thinking games like Futurama, Whiplash, and Command and Conquer General Zero Hour connected to the Polybius. Can I let you in on a little secret? I just read some top secret documents that said Polybius was developed during World War II in the fight in the land of the rising sun. Starting with the invasion of the beaches at Normandy and Allied Assault, EA has made big cinematic action openings for the Medal of Honor series, its calling card. Medal of Honor Frontline laid siege to the French coastline, but with a new angle on the attack. And not long after that, the Allied Assault expansion pack Spearhead gave the Normandy invasion a twist by dropping in from the sky as a paratrooper. Up to this point, all the MOH games have taken place in the European theater of war. Until now. Medal of Honor Rising Sun refocuses and recalibrates the action into the South Pacific for a fresh perspective on the other half of World War II. Sticking with the narrative storyline, Rising Sun engages the Japanese Imperial Army in the form of Joe Griffin. In the game, you take the role of uh, Corporal Joseph Griffin, and the young Marine Corporal who's stationed aboard the USS California uh, when Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor happens, and you're thrust into the war from that point on. Joe's wartime adventures will have him traveling from Pearl Harbor to the grass-covered landscapes of Guadalcanal to the jungles of Burma and the Philippines all the way to Bataan. We have an intertwined storyline with the sequel to Rising Sun, which will be out the following year, in which case she'll play Donald Griffin. So you'll see the other side of the story with a parallel timeline. It may be unlikely that any one Marine went to all the places traveled in Rising Sun, but in terms of combat, EA has stayed true to its roots when it comes to realism. We go to great lengths in terms of working with, uh, say, Captain Dale Dye, who's our military consultant, uh, Dan King, who's you know a Japanese side technical advisor, making sure that we use the right weapons in the right places, the battles happen at the right time. You know? The core gameplay of the Medal of Honor games has been the run-and-gun combat mixed in with some disguise and stealth elements and a little rail shooting. But new terrain calls for new approaches, 10 missions worth. Some of the new things that we're really proud of, though, we've uh, taken it from a fairly linear game. We've added a lot of multiple paths. We've added a lot of replayability in terms of their secret items that you can find. So we have standard objectives. We've actually got bonus objectives that you aren't given. You don't know that they exist until you complete something. Rising Sun is also loaded up with new weapons, usefully interactive environments, and an AI tailor-made to take the bonsai mentality of the Japanese soldier into account. Uh, all three of the versions will have three core game modes. You know, we've got our single-player game. We've actually implemented a co-op multiplayer mode where you play through the entire single-player experience, except we've customized it for cooperative play. In addition, on the PS2, we're going to be going to online, so you'll be able to play uh, up to eight players online, We've got ten maps. Not everything is completely new, however. Audio has always been a mainstay of the MOH games, and Rising Sun is no different. Environmental sound and combat effects keep the tension high, and the big orchestral score performed by the Hollywood Symphony gives the game an epic feel. <laughs> Medal of Honor, Rising Sun, let's take that hill.
You know, people say the first UFO didn't crash in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, but that it actually crashed in Osaka, Japan in 1945, and that the U.S. government had brought them here. <laughs> Maybe the previous technology was reverse engineered from there. No way. Way. You know who could help us out with this? A spy hunter. What does a covert missions operative need to solve the mysteries of the world? You got it, a sweet ride. And the G6155 Interceptor is arguably the world's coolest car, not named Kit, Herbie, or Batmobile. But the Interceptor is so much more than a car. It's a boat, a snowmobile, and most importantly, it's a spy hunter too. Well, Nostra, the, uh, the terrorist organization is back, and uh, they are uh, trying to create uh, a global catastrophe so they can take over the, the large nations of the world. What they're trying to do is, is they're trying to melt the polar ice caps. So you kind of uncover the story uh, throughout the game and you're trying to stop that from happening. The only chance you'll have to stop the evil terrorists is to push the Interceptor to its limits. Luckily, your driving capabilities are sky high. Spy Hunter 2 was developed by Angel Studios, which brought a smuggler's run in the Midnight Club series. So expect top level handling and a whole lot of speed. But the driving in Spy Hunter is always more than meets the eye. It's in the transforming. When you drive from surface to surface, your vehicle automatically morphs from a car to a boat, to a snowmobile, to a motocross bike, to a jet ski. And it also makes Julianne fries out of the baddies. We, we've added uh, we weapon customizations this time where you can, as you progress through the game, you get weapon upgrades. And before a mission, you can actually choose which weapons to put where on the car. Defensive weapons also take an upgrade. The fully rendered rear view mirror lets you drop your oil slicks and sticky bombs with precision, eliminating those annoying hanger honors that will chase you through the varied and expansive levels. So there's, there's four different environments. There's Asia, there's uh, New Orleans, there's the uh, Swiss Alps, and Russia. And every one of those regions has four missions. And every region has a boss battle, which is something new to spy on Earth. That's right, boss battles. And they come in the form of super vehicles, like the train. If you can't handle the bosses alone, Spy Hunter 2 features multiplayer action, including a two-player co-op mode, or face off against your friends in the versus arena battles. All this innovation, but Spy Hunter doesn't forget where the Interceptor comes from, the weapons van. There's actually gonna be rail sequences where you'll get in the, the weapons van and control a turret on top for a while while the car is getting repaired, and then you uh, take off down the road. If this isn't enough Spy Hunter news for you, get this. A big screen adaptation starring The Rock will hit the theaters summer 2005. So keep your calendars open, and in the meantime, keep transforming. Top secret missions and transforming cars. This mission's gonna be a lot harder than I thought. Wait a minute. Manga has a lot of stories about psychic abilities. Of course, that's it, psychic powers, that's the connection. I wonder if Futurama and Killswitch can help me. Mm, the future and the answers are in here, somewhere. G4 TV for gamers and Tech TV are connecting to form G4 Tech TV. Coming May 28th, stay connected. For more information, go to g4techtv.com. Euphoria, the award show for gamers, is starting soon. You know, a lot of people think that manga is blood and gore and big breasts and violent settings and stuff, but it's not. You know, it's people sitting around, doing homework, hanging out in the office, building relations. Shit. Dude, what are you doing? Somebody is following me. I should have known. I read something about the biomechanically engineered soldiers tied to the Polybius. Oh, that might have been one of them. Is he still out there? Nah. I think he flew away <gasps> with the Tooth Fairy <gasps> and Santa Claus. <gasps> My only way of stopping them is they hit their kill switch. <sighs> the rules of the game are gonna change. All you know is this. You are a bioengineered soldier who spontaneously regenerates his health. You have an arsenal of automatic weapons and a keen sense of taking cover when faced with enemy fire. And you keep having flashbacks. Who are you? Are you Jason Bourne from Bourne Identity? Are you Leonard Shelby from Memento? Or are you Sister Mary Clarence from Sister Act 2 back in the habit? That's all I wanted to hear. You'll have to play Kill Switch to find out. To play Kill Switch is to learn to survive a fierce reality-based third-person shooter and to learn to duck and cover. 
It's not your standard run and gun. You're going to be thinking about how you're going to use your environment, how you're going to move from cover point to cover point, how you're going to outthink your enemy. And because they're thinking too, they're going to try to be thinking how are they going to flank you, how are they going to get you out of that cover point um, or into the open. The cover system is based on your ability to grab objects in the environment and use them as cover. Buses, boxes, and piles of wood, they all work. And while you're taking cover, stick out your gun and shoot blindly. You can lay a cover of lead over an area without exposing yourself to enemy fire. But don't go thinking you're invincible, Mr. Smarty Pants, because these enemies didn't eat stupidos for breakfast either. The enemy AI keeps them in deep cover too. You're going to realistic, real-world environments. You'll be in hot spots of today's military uh, and political hot spots. Uh, places like the Middle East and uh, the North Korea areas and, and the Caspian Sea. In like the Middle East, uh, you'll be in the city streets, uh, infiltrating different buildings and, and such, and uh, you know, accomplishing different objectives. We have an oil rig. Each of the, the levels will have a, a really good ramping up of, of getting into a place, uh, achieving your objective, and getting out. And getting out is, is really where all hell breaks loose. And nobody knows how to equip themselves for Armageddon like a biogenetically engineered soldier of fortune. We have about uh, 10 plus different weapons, and they're all real real world weapons that we're basing off. So you know, we have the M4 with a 203 grenade launcher, the, uh, the SAW, the M249. Uh, uh, different sniper rifle, um, a shotgun, that, that sort of thing. So all, all the, the, the very realistic, real-world weapons, modern-day weapons. In addition to these pistols, you're packing a healthy assortment of grenades, including stinky grenades, flashbangs, and fry grenades. Let them fly. The mystery may lie in your identity, but the conspiracy lies in the kill switch. <laughs> Looks like he's gone. Man, I can't believe that I got government killer agents after me. <sighs> I wish there was some way I could look into the future. I wish there was some sort of Futurama device that could just distort the time-space continuum. <sighs> this is the end of the world as we know it. Futurama may be gone from network television. But in the world of video games, a world we're somewhat familiar with, Futurama will never die. That's because the fine folks at Vivendi Universal have heeded the call of the fans of the cult animated hit. At the risk of editorializing, this reporter applauds the demise of the pathetic human species. <laughs> yes, Futurama. The cartoon that wasn't The Simpsons, but never wanted to be. It strived for something different, like me. Different. <laughs> Also, why are you wearing that funky hat? Plot. Professor Farnsworth sells the Planet Express to that Steinbrennian businesswoman, Mom. Obviously, this leads to Mom taking over 50% of the world. Uh, that's cute. Making her the head honcho, Big Cheese, El Ruler Supremo. And with the help of her death bot troopers, Mom plans to enslave humanity. <laughs> Okay, okay. In hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have sold a Planet Express. The mission is simple. Go back in time to stop this event from taking place. Yes, a trip into the time-space continuum. There are four characters you can play as in Futurama. Fry, the pizza delivery guy from the past. Leela, a one-eyed sex pot who takes no crap. Bender, the robot who's all about crap. And last, but also last, the intrepid and ever so gallant Dr. Zoidberg. Each one has their own unique fighting style and specific weapons. And then there's Dr. Zoidberg. Not a pretty sight, but then again, neither is Zoidberg. The gameplay isn't gonna knock you on your Farnsworth. It's a puzzle jumper, or as those in the early 21st century called it, a platformer. Fry will specialize, although that may be too strong a word for the dim-witted Fry, in guns, and his action takes place around old and new New York. Leela does that Lara Croft thing, depending on hand-to-hand -hand combat to get her through the Sun Planet level. And Bender? Well, Bender spins around delivering more robotic moves than a whole season of Soul Train circa 1981. And Dr. Zoidberg? Well, what words can be used for Dr. Zoidberg? Hmm, that was odd. Mighty odd. All the actors from the television show have lent their talents to the game. That includes Katie Seagal and the voice acting name of names, Billy West. I can burp the alphabet. <coughs> A, B, D. 
No, wait. Futurama the Game was also written by the Emmy Award-winning writers of the show. Yes, that includes Matt Groening. He's kind of a big name in the world of animation, just in case you didn't know. As a matter of fact, or fiction, the game plays out exactly like the lost episode of Futurama. And judging by the ratings, a lot of the episodes may seem lost. But if you're one of those angry viewers who wrote letters or signed petitions, or like me, crawled up in fetal position and cried for more Futurama, cry no more. Futurama lives. So what was death like, Fry? Well, first, everything went dark. Then this bright light appeared, and it said, Game over. We've seen the future, and it's very bizarre. I don't know what to make of it. In my research of Polybius, I've noticed something called Whiplash, and something else called Command and Conquer Generals, Zero Hour. It's all very, very confusing. Note to self, get no deodorant. Fast. G4, TV for gamers and Tech TV are connecting. To form the only network taking digital entertainment to the next level. Sound fun? I love video games. Plugged in to every aspect of games, gear, gadgets, and gigabytes. That was unexpected, right? Okay. Uh, you're watching G4 Tech TV. G4 Tech TV. Stay connected. Tune in for a sneak peek of Tech TV all week at 4 p.m. and 11 p.m. For more information, go to g4techtv.com. Hey, man, do you think that I can look in your storage area? If I don't find a smoking gun of this mystery, it's a dead end. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I am so glad that you are here. I don't know what I'm doing. We can't talk here. What? Will you please help me out here? You can't stop now, Bill. You're close. You've never been closer. Nothing's worth dying over. If you give him now, he wins, and he'll continue its plan for global domination. Who wins? What plan? Uh, what? Oh. oh, this is giving me whiplash. <laughs> Top secret medical experiments gone awry? A crazy weasel named Spanx chained to an uptight rabbit named Redmond? Dogs and cats living together? Will the conspiracies ever end? I'm getting whiplash from all of this. Spanks and Redmond are escaping from the facilities of Genron, a high-tech uh, sort of animal testing product manufacturing facility. As such, they've each sort of been subject to testing within the facility. Spanks specifically has been the, the victim of electricity testing. Redmond's specialty was hair and makeup. Um, more specifically, the Dura Spray hairspray was a product that Genron was trying to perfect. On, on him and, and found a particularly strong batch. So, so his natural affinity is he's impervious to pretty much anything. And in creating the duo, one of the things we wanted to do was uh, get away from sort of a saccharine, sweet, cutesy, Disney-type feel. Um, we were inspired by things like Ren and Stimpy. True to their tweaked dispositions, the dynamic duo do their best at destroying the labs and scientists of the Genron Corporation. Geez, I hope I can get my 401k money back. In fact, destroying just about everything you see would be in the best interest of imprisoned animals everywhere, especially since there's a tracker that lets you know how much money you're costing the evil empire. The game definitely has combat as a focus. Um, we wanted to make sure we had an interaction set that was different than just platform jumping, so there's, there's plenty of environment navigation in the game, but we wanted combat to be a big part of the game. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to to create combat that, that wasn't brainless button mashing. Combining the powers of the team is as easy as chewing up Hyber Snacks and attributing the powers to either Redman or Spanx. Boosting up Redman, the indestructible rabbit, means he'll do more damage. Give the juice to Spanx, and the health capacity for the duo goes up. There's also a reward system for stringing together combos of combat and destruction. This pretty much results in the Hyper Bunny madness. And when Redman and Spanx need that extra backup, it will come in the form of other animals released during their outburst. Weasels, rabbits, monkeys, whiplash. You know, the Japanese have a saying for this. Oh yeah? What's that? I don't know, you're the one that works at the manga house. What's your point? My point is this. I think this is a test. It's my true hero's calling. 
I'm about to cross the threshold. We're getting to the zero hour. I've got to get moving. What was that? Tension's on. Our army again denied involvement. The military had the fragmented global liberation army on the run. The American response is its signature shock and awe campaign. The conspiracy is never ending. Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? And who is the true enemy of freedom? The Soviets and psychic scientists from the Command and Conquer of old were replaced by the Global Liberation Army for Command and Conquer Generals. The expansion to CNC Generals called Zero Hour once again teams up the good old US of A with Mother China to defeat the terrorist threat. No cost is too great. From visuals to sound, Zero Hour maintains the same slickness and presentation as Generals. Texture, lighting, and visual Visual effects are realistic and pretty, and the sound delivers the same sense of urgency and impact. The game is separated into single player and multiplayer, with the single player mode being subdivided into campaigns, skirmishes, and general challenges. Each army is mounted for five missions, and they all play on new maps with several new and modified units. They're attacking our base! The new campaign showcased the latest units, such as the U.S.'s microwave tank, which disables buildings and cooks troops. The Chinese Helix helicopter adds some death from above in the form of napalm and gunfire, and the GLA have a new sneak attack. There are a bevy of other weapons and upgrades available as well, such as saboteurs, combat cycles, carpet bombs, satellite hacks, chemical suits, and sentry drone guns, among plenty of other deadly options. General Dow versus... General Towns. A new feature is the General's Challenge, which is basically set up as a dirty fight in the alley. After you've been called out, you must figure out how to use your army to its strategic strengths. There are three generals for each army, and each specializes in a particular aspect of war. For example, General Kwai is big on tanks, while General Granger commands the skies with air power. After the initial selections, you build up your defenses and let the fighting begin. Good, bad, or ugly. In the New World Order, you never know who the true evil doers are, and it's only during the zero hour that men are made into heroes. No! No, you can't die! I don't have all the answers! Take this. What, what is this? Microfilm? Don't let it fall into the wrong hands. What? Help me, Bill Sindelar. You're my only hope. No. What am I supposed to do with this? I've got to see what's on this film. Maybe the answers are at gfortv.com slash blister. <sighs> Don't sweat it. I'll find a way. Or I'll duck down or I'll just fly out using my matrix powers. <laughs> Would you trust food of language that you can't understand or read? Can you see the script in the thing? Yeah. Get it out. <laughs> you don't need it. <laughs> she always Bill. <laughs> but then we've got the almond crusted sticks, which are really good with chocolate. are busy. I can never get everything done. But my brother Chris, he was born ready. Heck, he was walking at three months. Me? I prefer the thrill of last minute shopping. Hi, I need some stuff quick. Sure. For my wife, my uncle, three cousins, and some elves. All right. There's only one Chris Kringle. For the rest of us, there's Best Buy. Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, only for Nintendo GameCube. Rated T for Team. 
If someone wrote a book about your life, would anyone want to read it? Navy, accelerate your life. I try to kick as much ass as I can with what little I have. Darkness. You afraid? I'm not. When you take a talented team of artists, when you see that game on the screen, you say, wow, what is that? You see Vin Diesel there, and his muscles are buff. It almost looks lifelike. It's somewhat scary how realistic the graphics really are. Very few games I've played that I've actually been frightened at. And an epic film. They're damn near making movies and the games and games in the movies. You get something much more. It immerses you in this tense kind of horror, sci-fi kind of thriller thing. The tone of the game and mood is to really feel like Riddick. The character building is extremely important. You want to feel that like you are this character. You can have something that is, you know, a home run. This is the Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay. The dark can protect you. Long before Riddick would make his first appearance, a group of young programmers in Sweden were learning how to make games. My first introduction to games was uh, with a Spectrum uh, computer, and uh, I played Conan the Barbarian. Love that, I like hack and slash. I was always impressed when they did things you didn't think was possible. And at that time, that rarely happened in games. My friends, where I grew up, they were, you know, hobby programmers and making their own little games and so on. And that was really the start of it. Soon friends become a company and Starbreeze is born. Using the programming skills they had been honing for years, Starbreeze creates the game Enclave. One of the great things about Enclave is that it just had a really great visual look to it. There was an extra sort of visual finesse to what Starbreeze had done. You know, our technology was really good, and uh, we got a lot of appreciation for our style artistically. That's how we got introduced to Universal. They were one of the distributors of the game in the US. In 2002, while Starbreeze finishes up Enclave, thousands of miles away, a company starts thinking about making a title of their own. The concept of Tigrum is quite a unique thing. It's a game production company. Um, so it's neither a developer nor is it a publisher. Um, but its purpose is to create franchise or create IPs that can be used in all these different mediums. When Vim was setting something up in the game industry, it really clicked and had a lot of ideas. Having a Tygon, my company that creates these games, I can you know, use all of this pool of knowledge about the world and incorporate it into the video game and keep the video game consistent with the movie. Vin, you know, really knows games, um, which I, I was really surprised about. Plays obsessively, he's a big D&D fan. Totally embraced that kind of a form of entertainment. And I think you, you know, always had this concept right from the start, was to create a game company that can generate IPs, can generate franchise. While Tygon is thinking about turning a movie into a game, Starbreeze is doing the same. I was a marketing manager at that time, so I tried to f find projects for the team, and I went to Universal to make a Lord of the Rings game. And we were working with Enclave and the type of style. I thought, this is really cool for us to do Lord of the Rings. Starbreeze first came to our attention. They were doing Enclave on the PC for our paired partnership group. We got to work with them doing a port of the Xbox version to the PC. 
After going through Enclave and looking at it, we felt they were a perfect match to do the version of Pitch Black or Riddick. And then they approached us with Pitch Black instead, and that was the perfect thing for us, and we really were excited because it was not the same as fantasy. The guys wanted to do something new and do futuristic games, so Pitch Black was perfect. We work closely to extrapolate that into a game design. Riddick's their first uh, game that, that we're involved with. It's based in the universe of the Chronicles of Riddick and Pitch Black. It's not a movie translation game. It's not based on that film. It's a much bigger thing. It's expanding the story from both Pitch Black and Chronicles, and it fills in some holes about Riddick's background. When you have developers like Starbreeze, and when you've got Universal and Tygon, all coming together to make this gaming experience, you're gonna have something that is, you know, a home run. Now that the movie team has found a developer, the work is about to begin. In early 2002, the developer Starbreeze begins to work on a game based in the Riddick universe. But making a game based on a movie can be a difficult job, even for experienced developers. The exciting thing about using a licensed product um, foremost is from the beginning the team really felt like, I don't want to work on the licensed product, but since we had a chance to do a prequel to a movie, and not doing it based on the movie. We got more freedom to do more innovative stuff. Some game developers find that restrictive, but other developers think this is great. We can concentrate on making the game. We don't have to worry about creating this whole, you know, epic universe with all these characters and planets and locations. We can concentrate on making a great game. Before work on the game can begin, the dark. There are a few things to settle like what the game will be about. Being a producer on the Chronicles of Riddick allows me to lace the video game with story that complements the movie. There's information in the video game that helps you understand the movie if you want to really, really, really get deep into the kind of mythology of it all. The beginning of a game is always the most difficult part because you have no idea it hasn't taken shape yet so whatever you're doing you don't know you don't have that kind of focus that you develop later on everything by that point is utter chaos we try to retain some of the sensibilities from the movie So we're telling the story about Riddick when he escapes Butcher Bay prisoner walking which is a Triple Max prison facility on this. Planet of the game is, is taking place uh, prior to the Pitch Black movie. It's also prior to the new movie. Hey, what are you bringing to us? The game is set 10 years before the movie. We really wanted to, to do that in order to, to add value to the to the franchise as opposed to translating the movie directly into the game. Okay. So a player that gets through this game and then goes and sees the movie is going to get more out of the movie than someone that just goes to see the film. It's not just a play the movie game. Hey, come talk to me for a second, will you? It's actually conceived as a prequel to the movie. So the idea is that you'll play the game before the movie comes out, and it'll sort of lead you up to the actual film. And this isn't sort of some story that was dreamed up by the game developers and had nothing to do with the movie team. Uh, David Toy, who actually created the universe, he worked alongside the game developers to create the storyline for this, so it would really lead up to the movie in a fantastic way. So from day one, he's always been giving us feedback on our way of creating his universe. So it, it's great because you'll play the game, then you'll get to go see the movie, and you really get two stories for the price of one. In this huge epic, if you don't have the room, really, to explain some backstory... You cannot escape your destiny. I can escape anything. Like Butcher Bay. 
you can then take ideas that you don't have time for in the movie and now incorporate them into the video game in a cool way. The pit looks like a way out. So now the video game player is experiencing story firsthand in an intimate and interactive way. Maybe you got what it takes, Renee. You don't know so much about him, and, and that's interesting, and that's something that we get to tell in our game, is more about his background. Renick is like the, the evil character, but not really. We're gonna kill you! Very tough guy. He's extremely on his own, he's a loner, he's a lone wolf. He's a hero. He's not a super-powered guy, but he almost has superpowers. You get this feeling from the character that he can do anything. It's like in the movie where he just dislocated both arms to, to get free. He doesn't really care. It ain't the fall that gets you. He also has these features that make him a good for a game. You have been blind for far too long. But your world is about to get more colorful. He has his Riddick eye shine. He has his story about his previous life. A mystified character in a way. So he's really good and fits the game perfectly. What do you see? Everything. But even the best games can fall flat. Once the developers have found a setting for Riddick, they find things for him to do. So there is a, you know, a really balanced blend of stealth, <laughs> frenetic shooting, <laughs> intelligent navigation, locked to get further along in the game. Not a problem. And there are multiple ways of achieving an objective as well, so, so you can choose to be more stealthy or frenetic. Action and all that sort of stuff. The sneak mode in the game is, uh, is something that we put in there to give the player the feeling that, OK, now you're sneaking. You're really sneaking now. There's a stealth element to the game, which is really pretty interesting. When you actually go into stealth mode, the color of the screen changes, it basically turns to a blue hue so you know that you're actually hidden in the shadows. It's kind of nicer to do that as opposed to having a whole bunch of icons on screen. You, must be here somewhere. you don't have all these sort of, you know, windows all over the, the game screen to mask the environment. Someone's here. I'm gonna check. The eye shine in the game is something we use in dark areas. If he uses it in, in, a, in the light room, it's gonna be problem for him because it's going to get so saturated and bright so he can't use it there. But in dark areas he can use this. To really use the eye shine is to first take out the lights in an area. Who's breaking those lights? How can we do gameplay and atmosphere around this technical aspect? In its simplest form, you hide around a corner and you see someone's shadow, and that's a way to, to know where an enemy is. But in Riddick, we, you know, hopefully we've taken it to the next level, where you really do choose to take out lights and use the, the darkness to your advantage. It immerses you in this tense kind of horror, sci-fi kind of thriller thing. That's the entertainment value. The reason we use the first third person is that in first person usually you just see the world. We implemented that you can see your own body to get the more feel that you are the character and also that you get to see Riddick when we go in third person, when he climbs. Which makes you feel, oh that's me, you know, I'm playing. The combat system is really features first person fighting, where we try to emphasize the feeling that you are Riddick and you're hitting someone. And we really want to translate that as a, as a good feeling for the player. It's raw fighting, it's got elements of fighting, Come on, you coward. it's got elements of adventure. It's got 
uh, elements of storytelling. I should just have them put slugs in both your heads right now. Why ruin a nice car? And when you put it all together, <laughs> it's uh, one of the most anticipated games of the year. I expect things could get ugly. I'll be disappointed if they don't. The team at Starbreeze knows they need a look that is just as cinematic as the film it's based on. The technology in, in Riddick is the latest stuff you can see today. It's really using all the powers in the consoles and gives us an uh, engine that can take care of all the graphics and detail we really want in the game. I think what makes the Riddick engine interesting is the visual look of it. When you see that game on the screen, you say, wow, what is that? I've never seen those kind of graphics before. First of all, it's a stencil shadows, and it, we are using normal maps. What normal mapping is, is basically adding more depth and texture to a character, and it makes it more realistic, more like life. The shadows look more detailed and more intense, and therefore, when you look at a normal map character, you automatically say, all right, that's more like reality. That's where games should really go. The tone of the game and mood is to really uh, feel like Riddick. The character building is extremely important. You want to feel that you are this character. The best way of doing that is to, first of all, that you see yourself and it looks really good and real. That it doesn't look like blobs on the face. It's just a really, really uh, detailed face of Riddick. There's a finesse to it. That you see Vin Diesel there, and you know his muscles are buff, and when he walks, it just it almost looks lifelike. It's somewhat scary how realistic the graphics really are. He did 3D scans so we could get really good features on the character and his voice. You're not still mad about before, are you? I think that's the best way to build the mood, is to have the, the real character. Well, let's see. Am I still mad about before? <laughs> Just roll it when you're ready. Aren't you gonna do something for that weapon slap? Let's do one more round. Come up. Riddick wouldn't be complete without the actors who make the characters what they are. Hey, well, look here. Having the star doing the VO for the game is extremely important. Just to get the team's feeling that he's part of this project is very important. Get out of here. Also to get the, the right feeling of the game. I mean, if you have use of somebody else's voice, it will, it will be noticed. Now you ain't paid me for that shank, so it ain't yours. Come take it. It's all this part of being perfect on everything. It's also, of course, to have the star's voice. It belongs to me. We got the VO for Vin, which is great to have in the game. Now things get interesting. Obviously. He's a great character and makes the voice really good, and it, it really is Riddick. Security need some eyes. Vin Diesel is actually an integral part of the game, and what Vin has done is he actually really participates in the development of the game. So yes, his likeness is there and his voice is part of the game. Darkness. But he's actually a producer on the game, and I mean, in the past, people would say, oh, you know, a, a actor doing a video game, he's just gonna wreck it. I'm a real fighting game guy. But it's a tribute to Vin that he really has created a game that is really solid, and it shows that his involvement actually meant something in this project. Well, let's see. Am I still mad about before? I play Abbott. I'm in charge of the slam. Prisoner walking! We're telling the story, basically, of how Riddick, before he got to the movie, this is where he was in the slam, and, you know, he was a prisoner, and I play Abbott. You're a hard-ass Riddick, but we're about to soften you up. You know, I'm not really badass. We're moving again, Riddick. They just transmitted a safe route through the minefield. Originally, when I did this movie, a little longer than four years ago, I was really excited about, you know, the experience in working with Vin and, and David Tui, and we got down to Australia and had a blast down there, and... To actually come back and actually look at myself in video game form is uh, is really interesting. You're not, you got nothing left to live for, Riddick. I do. I shut up. You don't know what you're doing. That is right, Riddick. I play Shara, which is the same character I play in the film, The Chronicles of Riddick. 
I play his primitive side. I'm heard only by voice. Your destiny lies elsewhere, Dick. And I'm asking him to recover his identity. Doing voiceover is really different. You're not actually on a set. You're often not there with the other actors, so you have to really, really have a rich imaginary world. There is a fury within you. And that's sometimes challenging. Set it free. The Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay, combines the best of films and games to become a truly immersive and cinematic experience. The Xbox is a really powerful system. Riddick has really taken the Xbox to a whole new level. So people played Halo, they said, hey, this looks great. I can't imagine graphics getting any better. And then here we have Riddick coming out and taking the system to a whole new level. It's not the days of Pac-Man or, you know, where everything is just one dimensional. As the technology develops and everybody pushes the envelope as far as creating the games, the more that the public gets interested. The response to the game has been phenomenal. But it really is an amazing game in all aspects, you know, story and art and technology. Very few games I've played that I've actually been frightened at points. This is one of them. It's a very fun experience. It's not as precious as filmmaking. You get to do things and hide behind computer-generated characters for this video game just to have fun with. And that's what actors do. Actors play. Actors role play. Actors have fun. It's uh, a modern day puppet show. Come on, prisoner. Give up. PlayStation Magazine. 5 out of 5 from Game Pro Magazine. 10 out of 10 and Game of the Year from PSM Magazine. Snake is back. Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. Rated M for Mature. From Konami. Buried Treasure is brought to you by EB Games. We've got a buried treasure this week that's kind of confusing to me because this is my favorite Nintendo 64 game. It's called Jet Force Gemini, and when it was released, no one bought it. And I don't understand, because it's developed by Rare, and Rare was sort of known as one of the best game development companies in the world. And this game, I think, was their greatest effort. It had everything in it. There was flying levels, there was racing levels, all kinds of sort of 80s arcade shooting levels. The game is enormous. It takes a long time to play. And as you get through the different levels, your characters power up. And it is a very hardcore action game. And it's surprising to see these cutesy little characters, but then all of a sudden you'll see the aliens just splatter into big sort of clouds of green goo. Great playing game. Terrific Dolby surround sound. It's called Jet Force Gemini, and if you have an N64, this is essential. Check out this and other buried treasures at EB Games. We take games seriously.
developers who brought us Donkey Kong Country and Goldeneye. It's called Jet Force Gemini from Rare. Jet Force Gemini, man. You gotta tell me about this game. It looks killer. Man, this game is just bad. I mean, you got three different characters you can use. Uh, you gotta go through a bunch of stages, blow up a lot of enemies. The mines are. The mines are bad people. The mines are bad. Mines are bad. They're just bad. They're bad people. Who are these guys? What, what, what are these people all about? Well, this right here is Lupus. Lupus the dog. He's the dog. Yeah. This right here is Vila. Vila? Vila. Vila. Okay. You got it. And this right here, this is Juno. Juno. Right. You actually start off with Juno here. And uh, he has to rescue Vila, yeah. and then they both have to rescue Lupus. What's actually cool about it is when you mech up, in the in the game halfway through you mech up kind of get like some body gear yeah. and you actually have to uh use his special abilities to get through like juno he he can go through fire because he's red and uh vida can go through water because she's blue and uh lupus he can float and hover can you go through water basically yeah that's pretty cool but see but see i'm multitasking i can go through fire too so the game takes place in the future is it, is it still planet earth uh no this is another planet that are uh colonized by the colonists um, the Mizar come down they take over the colony and the colony actually works for the Mizar but they're trying to rebel so the Jet Force Gemini kind of the police of the galaxy come down and have to show them who's boss the gameplay is it you know, basically just killing stuff is that the whole deal uh, there, there's a lot of puzzles the Mizar they work together yeah. they sit back they get around each other they, they use it, their strength they use their, all their people where one will stay back and try to get you while the other come around behind you. They're very smart, but uh, basically you got to take them out. They're not that smart. Not smart enough for Jet Force. What is Jet Force? Is it like some sort of police squad or something? Yeah, they're kind of like the police squad of the galaxy. When things go wrong, they get sent in. It's just a great game. So many different multiplayer things in it. You got racing in multiplayer. You got battle mode in multiplayer. You got target shooting in multiplayer. I mean, these are from the same guys who did Banjo Kazooie and uh, Diddy Kong Racing, which is uh, some good stuff. Would you say the game's sort of an amalgamation of Banjo Kazooie and Diddy Kong Racing? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I'd say there are some aspects in there, like the racing and multiplayer, which is really cool. Yeah. You know, and the graphics from Banjo. I mean, they just used a bunch of technology in this game, like uh, real-time reflections and just a whole bunch of graphics. It's a bit different than a lot of the cutesy animal-type games that we're seeing from Nintendo. I mean, you gotta go and you gotta take care of the Mizar. I mean, they're coming in, they're trying to throw these colonists around, tell them who's boss, and you gotta show them what's up. That's right, because the Mizar, they're bad. Mizar are bad people. You want to take that Mizar down. No Mizar. Mizar bad. That's right. And then what do Mizar look like? They're Just like, so we know. They're ant-like creatures. Ant-like creatures. Ant -like creatures. Yeah, if you look like an ant, you're bad. Yeah, you gotta be. You're gone. Raid. You know what? I gotta play this game. It looks way too inviting. All right, let's go. All right, let's get out of here. We went to Crystal Dynamics to check out Gex 3 and Legacy of Cain, Soul Reaver. I'm here with people from the Gex team and we're gonna find out about Gex 3. Let's do it. Woo! All right, yeah. yeah! How is Gex 3 different from the two previous Gexes? Well, he rides all kinds of new characters like uh, burrows and camels and uh, alligators. He shoots weapons, he rides tanks. Uh, he's got some uh, new buddies. New buddies? 25 new costumes. What characters did you animate? Mostly enemies, uh, environmental stuff, just anything that needed to be moved. In the PlayStation, when you're working with lighting, what exactly, what are you doing? Pretty much touching every vertex with a little bit of every vertex and the mesh with a little bit of color. Touching every vertex right here. <laughs> the girl in the tree. What was the hardest part about animating Gex? Uh, battling the software, I think. Battling the software. Show them your tail. Yeah, you whip your tail around. Uh, if I do, I'll fall out of the tree. <laughs> Is this game like impossible? Is it for kids? Do you have different levels? What do you think? Uh, it's all on your shoulders it's, it's, now. It's all different, yeah. It's hard for me. It's, it's hard for you. Yeah. Okay. It's easy enough for kids, but hard enough But hard for, for programmers. Hard for yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest thing you had to overcome in this project. Definitely sleep deprivation. Yeah, yeah. give us a quick uh, rundown of the storyline. 
Gex has to make his way through all these different uh, media dimension related levels and rescue right. the, the babe at the end. You've been in all the print ads for the game. I I, I, I turn the magazines and whoa! And, that, and that's you! Exactly, it's me and Gex together, we're a team. And so here I am going, whoa! Because <laughs> she's right here in front of me. Thank uh, you. I can't wait to play it and uh, looking forward to Gex 4. Cool, everyone wait. I'm here at uh, Crystal Dynamics, I'm with Amy, who is the director of the new Legacy of Kane game for the PlayStation. From the outset, you guys set out to create a PlayStation game that would raise uh, gameplay and graphics and experience mm -hmm. in, in video game playing to another level. Right, that was the idea. We knew that right, right from the start what we wanted to do was increase the immersiveness of the experience. Explain a little bit about the gameplay. What, what are you going to be doing in this game? The main character's name is Raziel, mm -hmm. who starts off as a vampire. He gets turned into an, un, an undead Cost creature, him. basically, who has to, to survive. He has to live on the souls of his enemies, not the blood. He's driven it's in the same way that Kane was in the first game, by revenge on his former brother and his sort of his father figure. Like the action animations and stuff like that, where he's taking swipes at uh, different creatures and, and uh, vampires and stuff like that. Are, are those tons of fun to do? Animating the, the attacks and, and uh, impels and, and, uh, and, and especially the reactions that the, uh, that the enemies have to right. being hit. Um, that's, that's a lot of fun. Your primal state is on, in the spirit world, what we call a spectral plane. Right. Which is a very sort of uh, expressionistic nightmare place. You can, through force of will, tighten all the molecules in your body and take form. And then when you do that, the whole world shifts around you and you go back into the physical world where all your enemies are. All the architecture that was bent just writes itself in front of your eyes. Excellent. The light all changes, things like that. And so the player is constantly confronted with the need to decide where they need to be at any one time in the spectral or material world. One thing that really impressed me was the ability to move around, and uh, it just felt great. It felt different than a lot of PlayStation third-person action games that I've played. I think a lot of that is because Raziel has uh, got over 221 unique animations that are uh, segmented, upper body and lower body, separate, which makes a huge combination. I was a huge fan of the background story and the voice work mm -hmm. that went into the first game. How much of that was carried over? We have wonderful time. people down in LA that we work with. Anybody who was a fan of the first game for that reason will be more than thrilled with what we're offering here. It's like a, an interactive movie. I mean, the storyline is so rich. There's so much VO and dialogue, and it's just a great fiction. What's yeah. going to happen now? Are, are we? Uh, are you guys already starting work on Kane Three? It's, it's it's all germinating back then. We've left all kinds of interesting plot lines open to play with and. PlayStation. Maybe. I mean, Chris was definitely working on that stuff. Uh, you know, it's it's up in the air whether our next title will be PlayStation 1 or 2. And PlayStation's a great machine. Yep. And there's a lot of life left in that, too. Get the whole thing! The whole thing! You know, one of the most spectacular looking football video games ever is NFL 2K on the Sega Dreamcast. <laughs> I'm here at Sega with Marcus, the executive producer on the new football game for the Sega Dreamcast. You ready to go? Let's go. All right, one, two, three, three! 42! 42! Hut, hut, hut! So, uh, Marcus, do you guys got all the uh, NFL licenses for this? Yeah, we sent photographers out to every stadium in the NFL. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, is this more of an arcade game or a realistic thing or what? Actually, you know, for the football fans out there, if they play games like Blitz or Madden, we're kind of in between. We got a little bit of arcade in this into our games, we also got a little bit of sim. So we're right in between the two big football games. You guys do a lot of motion capture? Oh, or? absolutely, absolutely. Our football game will be one of the first with the most number of moves. We got over 1,600 animated moves, which is about four times the number of moves that you get in the uh, PlayStation and N64 products. One on the play. Oh, I would not have gone for it there, Dan. But then again, I'm not the coach. Oh. Peter, I think... And another first in our football game that we got that's really cool is that we were running at 60 frames per second. And if you remember back in the Genesis days with Joe Montana, right. those games ran at 60 frames per second. We're now on Dreamcast because of the new power we have. Not only does the graphics look good, but now we're giving the users more, more control by running at 60 hertz. If you play with Jerry Rice, uh -huh. if you know Jerry Rice, he's going to have the eye marks under his eye. He's oh, going to really? have the breathe right thing on his nose. Oh, that's and cool. if a player wears long sleeve jerseys under their uniform, we're going to have that represented. If he wears wristbands, he's going to, we're going to have that. We got every player modeled perfectly. And one of the cool things also about our game that you haven't seen before, we got our little VMU. Well, VMU? 
Oh yes. What the heck? It's BMU. It's a virtual memory card. Virtual memory card. I'm gonna be able to call my plays on the on my BMU instead of on the screen. No. So you can't see what pass play I'm calling or really? if I'm running the ball. So I can figure you out and, and do a little bit better with that. And you can take that to other controllers and other systems? Absolutely. And I can play at my friend's machine, put new plays and new or new players on there and go take it and play against you also. Now that's so it's a really cool. versatile thing. Catch. Hey, pass me that BMU. See what kind of hands you got there, baby. Are these all your secret plays? Oh, <laughs> I wouldn't give it up that easy, baby. <laughs> Actually, I'm modeling all the cameras in the games perfectly. So if you look at our football game and you're going back to the hole, you'll see a very television-like presentation style that you haven't seen on any of the instances before PlayStation. Really? Absolutely. Who do you got? You got like guys commentating and stuff? Oh uh, yeah, we've recorded over 100 hours of commentary time, 15 times more than what guys are doing with PlayStation on a Saturn. Uh -huh. And uh, I think you'll notice a huge difference in the level of commentary. Yeah, another cool thing about Dreamcast football that you won't see about other games is we got a modem that's going to be included in the box of Dreamcast. That's going to open up a whole new dynamic to sports game. It's going to include a 56K modem. Like I'll be able to kick your butt down in LA and you'll be up in San Fran. I still can kick your butt, but <laughs> we won't be able to do it in different cities right now. <laughs> One of the things that we will be able to do though is uh, allow you to update teams and rosters online, allow uh -huh. you to create plays when you're at work, and, and then download them into the game when you get home. It's all kind of cool new dynamics. Hey, well thanks First for showing me the game, Marcus. I can't wait to play this stuff. Oh, no problem. Before we wrap it up, let me see what kind of running skills you got. All right. Ready, set, Tackle my Sonic. Hi, I'm Mario Andretti, and you're watching Electric Playground. We'll be right back. We caught up with Mario Andretti, the superstar race car driver, who's out promoting the new controller from Mad Cats. You know, it's one of those fishing controllers. So we're here at the Mad Cats booth with Mario Andretti, and he's uh, showing off something that he helped design. Yes, absolutely. Actually, it was a lot of fun to work with the Mad Cats people because uh, these guys really get it. They come to the racetrack and, and during testing sessions, and we sit down, and they would try to just ask all the pertinent questions. Yep. And then we just try to get them on the same page, just to get them to realize the idiosyncrasies of uh, when you jump the curbs and when you did some that. It's a rugged little steering wheel. Then. Oh yeah, I mean this thing obviously you can see all you have to do is look at the cockpit of this race car. Yep. It's the same thing. It's it's metal. It's not just a plastic piece. Yep. You can just feel even by the weight. But it's a sturdy piece. You almost feel like you can do the 24 hours of Le Mans with no problem. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like the uh, racing game? Games that are out there. Do you think that they uh, they stack up pretty good? It's pretty darn realistic. But honestly, to be competitive in this world, uh, you have to be that because these kids, the try, they really are experts. Right. They know what they want, and they expect nothing less than as real as can be. It's been a few years since uh, Andretti Racing. Do you have another racing game that's going to be uh, gracing the shelves anytime soon? We have some prototypes in the background. Yep. And uh, all you have to do is stay tuned. Okay. Stay tuned. That's what we like to hear. Hey, well, it's an honor to meet you. Thank you. I hope you're having fun out here. Well, try the wheel. EP takes a look at some of the newest, coolest, first-person shooters on the market these days. Jeez, watch what you're doing with that thing. I am here with a good friend, Cliff, who is the designer. What, what's your official title? Co-designer, lead level designer on the Unreal projects. Unreal. This is the man right here. Man leader. We've got your back. Zoom in on the eyes here. Freaky. Let's talk about Unreal Tournament. That's what you're working on now. Yes, Unreal Tournament is like Mortal Kombat with teams and guns. You do not need an internet connection to play the game. What? Oh, yeah, everybody's tagged this thing as a multiplayer only game. Yeah, it's a, I didn't even know that. It's a croc, it's a croc. You pick your character, you play against other combatants in different arenas. There's all sorts of team games, great AI. It's a great single player game as well. Really? Make sure you check it out, yeah. Now, what are some of the, the, the mission things that you got oh, going yeah. on? We have this great game type called Assault, and uh, one team attacks while the other team defends. And like we got these different scenarios, one's like a D-Day invasion, and like you're storming the beach and like saving Private Ryan. No, yeah, and one team's trying to defend it, and people are blowing up everywhere, and it's great, great fun. Awesome, well, what's your favorite level? I have to say the high-speed train. One team starts off in a chopper, and they're like, you know, there's a little voiceover, it's like, oh, Abel, assault the base, you know, dog, I'm going in. Oh, man down, man down. Man, man. 
train. I feel like in the middle of a James Bond movie. It's really great. Really? Yeah. Really so uh, can we expect it on any more platforms? Or are you just are you guys just concentrating on PC? We're actually talking to some other people about possibly doing a color Game Boy version of it. No, are you serious? Absolutely. Uh, we're also looking into the possibility of doing a PlayStation Unreal as well. That would be cool. And of course, PlayStation 2 looks mighty delicious. Isn't there some weird, like, aren't they doing Unreal jewelry? Or well, we'll have some Unreal jewelry, possibly earrings, maybe necklaces. We, we already have keychains. Furniture? Hey. Unreal furniture would be that, cool. I don't think that big U would be very comfortable to sit on top. <laughs> very cool. Thanks a lot, Cliff. Good luck. Can't wait to play. It sounds awesome. Hey, I want to get it out. Hope you like it. We're here to talk about Quake 3. How are you doing tonight, Paul? Awesome. So what can you tell me about Quake 3? We're kind of redefining the whole first-person shooter game. We want people to jump on the internet and play this game. We're going to make it easy to do it, and we're going to make it fun to do it. What are some of the big key features that are in Quake 3 that weren't in the first two games? Well, we've redefined the animation system. It's going to be fast-paced, furious. Deathmatch is going to be like a household name. Um, do you think this is the end of it, or do you think we'll always see more Quake games? No, this is the last Quake product. The whole point of Quake 3 Arena is to put everything we've ever done it in on steroids. You know what I mean? We're maxing out, and, and we're not coming up with anything new, so to speak, but we're taking what we've done in the past, and we're giving it the richness and uh, the, the high quality that today's technology allows us. Excellent. Any uh, final words? I'm going to make uh, very nice models for the game. Of me? Of you. Thank you. You're gonna, you're got gonna that be on in tape now. He has to do it. You're in the game. You hear that? Me, Zoe Flower, in the game, Quake 3. It's going to happen. Hydro Thunder. Hydro Thunder. What now. Uh, it's a very fast, colorful, fun, quick action game. Oh, it's so cool. In one player mode. One player mode, yeah, two player. Two player mode they is slow. Way down. down. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just ridiculous. It's unbelievable. They have these wicked looking boats. They're super fast in one player mode. Lots and lots of colors, lots of styles. They, they all come in their own sort of unique shape. And when you when you hit the turbos thing, the turbo things they all morph and their engines pop out the back and these big blasts of fire come out. Super fast, huge drops. Give me something new on and the Dreamcast. It's a new system. I want new games. I've been but playing this game wants a year. An arcade game on the Dreamcast, and it's a good translation. The only thing that I have a problem with is that it's just an exact translation. It's right. just the arcade nothing game. Nothing extra. Nothing. No, no extra. extras. It's just it's just arcade at home. It's a solid game. They dropped the ball in two-player mode. I'd give it an 8.5 out of 10. I give it an eight. Uh, what do you think of Demolition Racer for the Sony PlayStation? This is by Pitbull Syndicate. <laughs> Car physics aren't perfect yeah, like no. Gran Turismo. You hit a car and it goes flipping up in the air, yeah. which I like though. I think I, that's I, cool. I did too. The physics are very arcade style, very, very light and very, very quick to play. Right. Um, and I don't think the game suffers at all from that. I think no. it's one of those games you sit down, you play it, you're bashing cars around, getting big points, yeah. big fireball explosions, huge jumps, lots of lots of crazy stunts. It's a fun game. I actually worked on this game for about a year doing the sound on it and yep. stuff. Oh, did I mention the sound was great? The sound's really good. Okay. In this game. But anyway, no. Uh, you one, made me say that. One, one thing they did incorporate in there, like, two player mode was fun. Two player mode screen was, was okay. worked really well. Split screen, I had which that. is rare on the PlayStation, so it was cool. There's lots of different things. You can play tag and you can play, you know, there's all sorts of different game elements to play. You it's want a, to get that? It's a value pack game. It's a value pack game. It's something that, uh, you know, it, you're going to get a lot of a, a lot for your money out of this one. And you should check it out. I'd give it an 8 out of 10. I, exactly what I give it, an 8. 8 out of 10? Yeah, okay. What, what did you think of Outcast for the PC? This is like a third person thing, like your Tomb Raiders and Metal Gear Solids and stuff. But the guy runs like... He's no motion captured character. Oh, either. it's yeah. awful. And how about the way he jumps? <laughs> what the hell is that all about? He's, he's light on his feet. Listen to me. The best part of this game, by far, bar none, is the orchestral music. Oh, Moscow yes. Symphony Orchestra did it. There's choir, there's... Play this game just for the music. You can just leave it on your PC running and you just be sitting back and it's it's like a movie soundtrack. The thing that's cool about Outcast is the story element. It's really, really well done. There's a lot of non-player characters in the All game the that you talk languages. to. All different languages. You learn a whole new language in this game and you get, a, you get a complete lexicon so you have to learn all these new words and stuff. And 
and uh, you basically go talk to all these different alien creatures. I kind of found it hard sometimes to shoot characters because of certain camera angles, like you, you know, my head would pop up, and I'm trying to shoot yeah. things, and I couldn't because my head was in the way. And well, they you know, there's some camera angle issues. The developers spent four years making this game. Four years. It's been a long time making this game. Four years. The thing that's amazing with the game is that it's incredibly deep. You can virtually go anywhere you want to in the world, and there. Are the control schematic is really original, and the uh, the weapons that you get, and the movements that are in the game, and the, and the dialogue, the voice acting is all really solid. It's uh, it's a great adventure, action adventure game. I thought it was definitely worth your time. I give it 8.5 out of 10. I give it a 6.8. Here's uh, our favorite game of the year so far, Tonic Trouble on the Nintendo 64. What do you think of that? Okay. The fact that anyone published this game is, is insulted gutsy. my intelligence. <laughs> if somebody were to sit down and say, okay, let's make the worst video game ever, <laughs> Tonic Trouble is what they would have got. It really falls short. It's way, way below what you're expecting on a Nintendo 64. The best part is you're sliding down this stupid ice thing, right? And then you go into like a, uh, you go into a certain sections, and I don't know why, but the just screen just goes black. <laughs> Wait two seconds and then you keep going. It's like again. it's like it's loading in the next level, but it's on the Nintendo. So what the all, heck's all going on? All the characters on? are really lame looking as well. How about the newspaper with the eyeballs? Uh, you know, it's like uh, it's like they fake the they, bouncing they with, tomato yeah, thing. They went with the first idea that went into their heads. There's no refinement in this title at all. Awful graphics, awful sound, yeah. awful gameplay, awful design. Blech. I can't find any redeeming qualities. Yeah, bas to it. basically, you don't really want to play it. That's what we're telling you. <laughs> I give the game a three out of ten. Actually, three. I don't know where you get three from. I, I give really it a don't. three out of ten. It's a two. I think it's a three, it's man. It's a two. All right. It's awful. Tonic trouble. Woohoo! Yeah, two thumbs up for two. Thumb two. Yeah. All right. See you next week. Nick! Hey, the most spectacular looking football video game ever is NFL 2K. Financial assistance for the Electric Playground is provided by Sony Computer Entertainment, publishers of Um Jammer Lammy for the PlayStation. Activision, publishers of Battlezone 2. And Computech Media, publishers of Insight Video Games, Insight PC Games, and InsightGames.com. Watch for the premiere issues of the magazines coming October 26th. Ninja Gaiden will probably be the tightest action video game in terms of control mechanics and depth of control, depth of action. The Ninja Gaiden is definitely the game I'm most excited about for the Xbox this year. I think it's probably the best 3D action game this fall. Tune in to G4's Holiday Hit List all this month. Today on X-Play's non-denominational gift guide, it's that season again. Which season, you say? We won't be specific, but we will say that it's time to spend, spend, spend on games, games, and more games. Cha-ching! It's game time!
Get your feet up in front of a roaring fire and join your hosts, Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Doesn't that look nice? Oh, it's so beautiful. It's the best tree ever. Oh, it's you. Hello there, and welcome to X Play's non denominational gift guide. We've got a show filled with the best games for every console from the Xbox to the GameCube and the ever popular PS2 to the cute little Game Boy. Yes, and the mighty PC. Is that a dreidel? Yes. I made it out of clay. We hope our show is inclusive in every way, representing every console, every game genre, every religion, and all the spirit of the season. Or the non-spirit of the non-season, if that's your preference. Let's just say that it's the time of year when, for some reason, you might want to buy something for that game lover in your life. Or just buy something for yourself. You selfish bastard. We've taken all the great games coming out this winter and selected the best of the best for your approval. From our X Play family to yours. So sit back, relax, and help us celebrate our top four Christmas. Uh, uh, uh. Sorry, seasonal game picks for the PlayStation 2. The PlayStation 2 is all about selection. With the largest game library of all three consoles, it makes for easy shopping. This holiday season has plenty on tap for the PS2. Check it out. James Earl Cash, found guilty and sentenced to death. It's the next game from the minds behind Grand Theft Auto. That's more than enough to get our number four pick. You've had an unexpected reprieve. You play as a death row inmate who has been spared in order to be the lead performer in a sadistic director's snuff film. It's not who you kill, it's how you kill them. Like Rockstar's other games, this sadistic and creepy game is definitely not for the kiddies. If you're shopping for a wrestling fan, our number three pick is guaranteed to make them drop kick anyone nearby with joy. WWE SmackDown Here Comes the Pain is a flying elbow drop to the dome of other grapplers. It has more match options than you can count, and the story mode is the closest thing to being in the real WWE, this side of the Playboy photo shoot. SOCOM 2 is the follow-up to the most popular online console game ever released, and it's looking to make even more fans this time around. The single player is more than just an afterthought, with 12 missions that ask you to lead a four-man team. Had to break the hold fire, sir. Hostiles were dangerously close. Count on plenty of sneaking around, clutching your sniper rifle. Of course, playing online with SOCOM 2 is where it's at. Up to 16 players can slug it out online in 12 new maps and 10 from the original. Just don't forget your network adapter. When you say staying power... Yo! Yo, Nukedi! Say, say, you. Kachbudala? Oh. The original Ratchet and Clank was good, but the sequel is our number one pick for the PS2. Because it has more gadgets, more gameplay. And more fun. After becoming Galactic Heroes in the last game, the duo must return a stolen creature to its creators. Well, as you can imagine, we've been pretty busy. After Drek's defeat, there were parades, press conferences, fancy dress balls. And the wiener roast at Al's. Oh, yeah, that. Making the job a bit easier is a wide selection of upgradable weapons, including a whopping 18 new guns. Get this one for your loved ones and prepare not to see them for a couple of days. That man that looks like a great stocking stuffer for Grandma. Mm -hmm. Not that you have to stuff any stockings this season. Right, Buddha? You know, when I bundle up for a sleigh ride in the snow, I always take my Game Boy with me to while away the hours. I mean, who wants to spend their time looking at nature's vast majesty when there's portable gaming to be had? Unless you worship nature, and that's okay. It sure is. Here are our picks for the best games to get the Game Boy in your life. Or Game Girl. The Game Boy Advance seems to be the only platform capable of rivaling the sales of the PlayStation 2. If you're looking for gifts for the handheld gamer in your life, here we go. 
The GameCube may not be a haven for RPGs, but Nintendo has picked up the slack on the Game Boy Advance. The best RPG for the handheld, and our number three pick is Golden Sun The Lost Age. Featuring some of the best graphics to ever grace a handheld game and an engrossing story, GBA owning RPG fans will be quiet for days on end digging into this one. Relive all the magnificent splendor of Super Mario Bros. 3 on the cute confines of your Game Boy Advance with Super Mario Advance 4, our number two pick. Take to the skies in the first Mario game that allowed the portly plumber to fly. For a 13-year-old game, it's held up remarkably well and will make a great addition to any GBA owner's library. Our number one pick for the GBA is the epitome of what handheld gaming should be. WarioWare and Mega Micro Games is a huge collection of off-the-wall minigames that will have you busting a gut as you play. It's the kind of game you can pick up and play for short periods of time without losing your place, and it's just as involving as any other game on the GBA. If you're buying one GBA game this holiday season, Make it WarioWare. I could play that WarioWare all day long. Don't you go away. I'm going to have the interns heat a couple of mugs of hot cocoa. And when we get back, we have more games and more good times. Stop it! That's no damn it! Oh. Once again, from our hearts to yours, Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. And Tim Conway always makes me laugh. Oh, look who's come back. Please, come on in. Come on in. Sit down. Please, sit down. Welcome back to X-Play's non-denominational gift guide. Hot cocoa? And that's all right. We've been showing you some of the best games to buy this season, whatever this season may be. Isn't that right, Festivus Paul? Uh. So let's keep this merry train rolling by showing you the best that the Xbox has to offer. I scalded myself. While many are still disappointed that Halo 2 has been delayed into 2004, there's still plenty to get excited about on the Xbox this holiday season, especially as online gameplay with Xbox Live is really hitting its stride. Let's take a look. Tennis, you say? How can a tennis game be the number four pick on the Xbox this holiday season? Spend a few hours with Topspin and you'll know why. Fans of Sega's Virtua Tennis take note. Topspin is the logical evolution of tennis video games. The gameplay is simply superb, with all the lobs, drop shots, backhands, and forehands you can handle. Xbox Live support is the icing on this clay court cake. Plus, it's got Anna Kornikova. Get it now, before she becomes a TV personality for good. Our third pick on the Xbox started as a PC series, but has since been moved to Microsoft's machine. But don't get the wrong impression, it hasn't been dumbed down for the console crowd. This is one slick shooter. The single player mode as you take in the role of a lady killing sky pirate who must save the world from the vile Nazis. You know for a man with a reputation as a charmer, you sure make a terrible first impression. Pilot 10 different upgradable craft in an alternate 30s universe and become the king of the skies. But the action doesn't stop there. You can continue the fight on Xbox Live against 15 other players as you compete for air dominance. Our number two pick on the Xbox is an oldie, but a goodie. Well, it's an oldie if you've been playing a lot of PC games. Anyway, Counter-Strike began as a homebrewed mod for Half-Life and eventually spiraled into a game that's still being played by millions of people almost half a decade later. The Xbox version could be the ultimate online game for shooter fans, but be warned, if your loved one's not planning on playing Counter-Strike online, the bomb has been planted. It's 
probably not the best gift. Forests win. In case you haven't figured it out by now, the Force is strong with Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. If the person you're shopping for is a Star Wars fan, prepare for plenty of hugs and kisses when it's open. It could quite possibly be the best Star Wars game ever released for a console. Play as a dark or light Jedi as you visit all the popular Star Wars locales in this epic RPG. Did you like that? We sure hope you did. And whether you're a Jedi or a tennis player, we know you'll find something to like on the Xbox. I like that Anna Kornikova. I wouldn't mind her wrapped up under the tree. Yes, but that would be kidnapping. <laughs> <laughs> now, I hope you Nintendo fans weren't feeling left out. But if you were, we've got GameCube titles for you and your kin. The GameCube is gaining steam with its new $99 price and just in time for the holidays. Just go for it. With so many great exclusives on Nintendo's little purple box, there's really no excuse not to have one. Our fourth pick for the GameCube is so absorbing you might need some Dramamine and a bucket to deal with its nausea-inducing curves. F-Zero GX is the kind of game that gradually gets under your skin until you're compelled to keep going back and improving. If you're looking for futuristic racing action, this is your one and only stop. Pick number three goes to a timeless Nintendo classic, the Mario Kart series. The first installment for the GameCube is called Double Dash because it allows two characters to race on the same cart. One steers while the other fires off the weapons. Of course, it wouldn't be a Mario Kart game without multiplayer options, and Double Dash has plenty. The battle mode returns along with a few new twists on the formula. Throw in a cooperative Grand Prix mode and you've got yourself a game you'll be playing for years to come. Our number two pick needs no introduction. This game really stirred up the fanboys with its cel-shaded look. But after playing it, it's hard to imagine Zelda any other way. This one's got it all. Action, adventure, weapons, and plenty of mini-games. Sail the seas in Link's boat and control the wind using his magic wand. Just watch out for falling fanboys. Just when you think video games are starting to get stale, a game like Beautiful Joe comes along to blast your expectations to bits. Who, oh, me? And Joe smashes a lot more than that along the way. After his girlfriend gets sucked into a movie, the girl is mine. he turns into Beautiful Joe to rescue her. Let's get it on! Best of all, it's non-stop action that's hard to beat. If you buy one GameCube game this year for the important people in your life, make it Beautiful Joe. Those sure were some festive games. Yes. And don't go anywhere because we have so much to share with you. Good cocoa, isn't it? I wouldn't know. I switched to gin five minutes ago. <laughs> Once again, your ho-ho hosts, Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Oh, that's so nice. Adam, look, they came back. Super! Welcome back to our non-denominational gift guide. Whether you're a pagan, an atheist, a Jedi, or none of the above, we have games that are just perfect for you. And if you own a PC, you'll want to give it one of these games. The PC is known for a wide selection of shooters and strategy games. This year is no different. Get your guns clapping and your mouse clicking with this year's holiday selection. Fire in the hole! Playing out like a graphic novel, Max Payne 2 picks up right where the first one left off. Max, now a detective, 
gets mixed up with a troublesome dame named Matt. Mona Sachs. We gotta stop meeting like this. Which eventually digs up skeletons in his closet. Featuring refined bullet time play, this is one smooth ride from beginning to end. Finish her! Oh, God! The physics in the game are so refined that it turns into a play toy. For adults. It's short, but it's also a very sweet gift for any PC gamer on your list. Real-time strategy games appeal to a certain audience, but a number three pick for the PC has that vanilla appeal normally reserved for boy bands and pop divas. Rise of Nations streamlines the turn-based strategy process by automating a lot of tedious control options. The fast-paced combat doesn't hurt either, with 18 civilizations to play over eight different ages. Even players who normally detest these types of games will have problems snoozing off. Play as American, British, and Russian soldiers in our second pick for the PC, Call of Duty. World War II shooters aren't exactly few and far between, but the quality displayed by Call of Duty makes it worth going back to Europe one more time. You fight alongside your allies as epic battles throb all around you, but you're not forced to micromanage them or guarantee their safety. With a thrilling single-player campaign in five multiplayer modes, buy this game for the PC gamer on your list and you won't have to worry about keeping the receipt. Our number one pick needs no introduction to PC gamers. I told them to run. As the follow-up to one of the most original shooters ever released, Deus Ex Invisible War looks to expand the series' unique gameplay. Taking place 15 years after the original, each time you play through Invisible War is a unique experience with multiple endings depending on decisions you make throughout the game. This RPG shooter hybrid is sure to inspire more than a few eggnog toasts. You know what would make this moment perfect? A roaring fire? You read my mind. What? I'll go light up one of the interns right now. Don't go away. We've got more titles coming up. Uh, it burns! It burns! Wishing you all the best, your hosts, Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Am I ever glad to see you. We were just roasting chestnuts over one of the interns. We've reached the final chapter in our journey, but before we show them the best of the best, I... Adam, I got you something. <gasps> Morgan, I got you something <gasps> too! Oh my gosh, you shouldn't have. Oh... Oh, oh, Adam, what is it? It's a gun con to go with your copy of Time Crisis 3. I sold my copy of Time Crisis 3 to buy you SOCOM 2 to go with your headset. But I sold my headset to get you a gun con. <gasps> oh, well, it's the thought that counts. It sure is. And our final thoughts tonight concern the best multi-platform games on the market right now. Here they are. 2003 has been a great year for multi-platform releases. These are six great games you can give or receive for all three consoles. Help me out, Jade! Number six, EA's Lord of the Rings Return of the King is a no-brainer for the film buff on your list. It features all the major battles and action scenes from Return of the King. Gorgeous graphics, massive levels, and fluid combat make this the movie tie-in game to rule them all. Yo, tough guy. Over here. Not a fantasy fan? You might prefer the kung fu police action of number five, True Crime Streets of LA. Set in a highly accurate recreation of Los Angeles, True Crime is Grand Theft Auto on the other side of the badge. You play a tough talking cop, Nick Kane, out to clean up the city of angels by busting everyone from muggers to international crime cartels. Sounds like a line from a bad video game. Nick. Our fourth pick is Tony Hawk's Underground. Underground's new rags to riches story mode is a breath of fresh air for the series. Create your New Jersey street rat and skate to impress the pros and to accomplish menial tasks for your friends. Rack up huge combos in front of the pro skaters to advance. But watch out for those walls. Yo, I wonder what else we got around here. Crackling bag. 
Another extreme sports title occupies slot number three. SSX3 is guaranteed to please any snow bro with its tight controls and huge open mountain courses. It boasts tons of personality and the most over-the-top tricks we've ever seen. If you can't be out on the slopes in person, this is the next best thing. At a strong second place is Ubisoft's Beyond Good and Evil. This unique and refreshing adventure game is a synthesis of a multitude of gameplay elements. You've got exploration, photography, hovercraft combat, fart-powered boots, and puzzle solving. You also get to kick enemy soldiers in the butt. <sighs> and rocking the number one slot is Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. Sublime platforming and adrenaline-pumping combat are the order of the day in this Arabian adventure. Add in fantastic level design and the ability to control time itself. I could turn back time. And you've got a game that's going to end up on a lot of best of 2003 lists. No matter how you celebrate or what you celebrate. Or if you celebrate. I think you'll agree that this is what the season is all about. Uh-huh. Come on, everybody. We've shared a lot. From all of us at X Plague to all of you, happy non denominational winter season. Happy non denominational winter season! On March 19, technically the procedure is brain damage. Get ready for a hugely entertaining, Do I vomit? wildly imaginative, <gasps> that baby's history, mind erasing masterpiece. That's working like gangbusters. Jim Carrey, Kate Winslet, Eternal Sunshine, rated R. Baseball 2004. Ready for everyone. EA Sports. It's in a game. Today on this extra special edition of X-Play, it's X-Play's non-denominational gift guide. We've got the best games of the holiday season for you and your kin. Hold on to your jingle bells. It's game time. Sunday night! Your ho ho host, Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. The medication, it is starting to oh, work. Wonderful. Oh, hello there. Welcome to our extra festive, non denominational gift guide. Tis the season of giving, and today we bring you our list of the best games to buy your cherished ones this holiday season. I cherish myself, and that's why I got me Blood Rain 2. Because I'm lonely. <laughs> <laughs> so, whether you worship Allah, Jehovah, 
or the films of George Lucas, we've got a little something for everyone on your list, regardless of whom or what you pray to. Please, Hanu Man, please don't let episode three suck. Oh, I sure second that, don't I, giant traitor? Today, we'll show you all the best games for the ever-popular PS2. The powerful and sleek Xbox. The beloved and highly popular PC. And the GameCube. It's not doing so well. Nintendo sure needs a holiday miracle. Isn't that right, Buddha Claus? Even though it's the tiny Tim of the console world, the titles we're about to show you can still fill your GameCube with holiday cheer. I'm filled with bitterness. <laughs> While the GameCube has been a little short on the role-playing games, Tales of Symphonia should satisfy the needy RPG freak a few times over. There's a whole lot of game in this puppy, like 60 hours worth. That should hold all but the most friendless gamers until the bunnies start getting busy later next year. On top of that, combat is in real time, so even those who refrain from RPGs can find something to enjoy here. Except for these big-headed kids who should learn to keep quiet. You're so stupid. Pikmin 2 is the ideal game for people who don't even like games, otherwise known as poop heads. Both visually inventive and shamelessly endearing, the game mixes strategy and puzzle solving with the escapist joy of hurting wild-eyed monochrome flower people to their death. The game may look childish to the imaginatively impaired, but trust us, there's some challenge. And there's some great cooperative multiplayer action. This is one unique game with legs. Little stubby ones that are also oh cute. Paper Mario, the RPG unlike any other, except the other Paper Mario RPGs. It's upbeat, borderline ridiculous, and an amazing amount of fun. Like most Nintendo products, it's a game that just about anyone can get into, but will provide more than enough challenge before completion. If RPGs always turn them off with earnestness and juveniles, then the Mediterranean stereotypes, bosoms, and fungal whimsy is the perfect antidote. And the humdinger of this GameCube year-end love fest is easily the return of the lady who talks little and hugs less, Samus Aran in Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. If you're someone who played the first one, then this recommendation is redundant with experience. One of the best games of the past few years is back in all its eerie glory. Not so much a shooter as an adventure game with missiles. There's nothing else out there quite like it. Wow, that Metroid Prime 2 Echoes looks just like my career used to be. Full of promise. Oh, with so many good games for this little platform, you'd think someone would be buying it. But they sure aren't. Sorry, little friend. I guess if we've learned one lesson this console cycle, it's that an online component really is important. So maybe you GameCube fans would like a network adapter? Or perhaps just a cup of Mr. Sessler's special cocoa? Smells like aftershave. Oh. <laughs> you know, a console without online play is like Hanukkah without a menorah. Pretty dark. Well, don't worry. No platform does online gaming better than Microsoft's chunky console. Mm -hmm. Maybe these games will help put the Xbox into your Xmas. Oh. <laughs> when a crappy film franchise makes for an excellent game, people pay attention. When it looks this good, you pay even more attention. The Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay is a marvel of technology and game design. A stealth game from the first-person perspective, it's heavy on ambiance and violence, with a touch of horror. Now it's a mature game for those that love dystopia and grit. Hey, John, so you get Don't let the gas man's starring role turn you off. Yeah, it is a little old, but what was amazing in January is just as amazing today. Ninja Gaiden is initially a game with more wow power than you can imagine. Beautiful, fast, and furious. It's one of the best cases for the Xbox's power. Beyond that, it's a game that demands skill and an intense desire to kick ass and look damn good doing it. Not too hot for beginners, but a must-have for everyone else. Fable may have taken much longer to come out than it does to play, but it's definitely one of the system's standout titles for the year, adopting a good or evil branching path. Hey, you can't do that! 
This is a fun one for all skill levels to play through multiple times, if only to mess around more with the reactions of the populace. Come on. Get married. Let's get hitched. Kill your spouse. Oh. Grow horns. Be a goody two shoes or experiment like they do in college. You make a great couple of blokes. A couple of blokes together. It's all here. The most gorgeous man I've ever laid eyes on. The best case for Knights of the Old Republic 2 is, well, Knights of the Old Republic. The amazing gameplay is all there with a new story. That means last year's best game is more or less here. Plus, you start as a Jedi, and those who completed the first outing will find it influencing this chapter. So, if they liked KOTOR, do we need to connect the dots? So, yeah. Halo 2. Could he possibly make any more noise? I guess so. It's, well, you know, Halo 2. Definitely so right. after playing Halo 1 and Raggedy ass flames. Ooh, rah. Come on, do you really need me to spell it out for you? Halo 2. There's this. And this. Plus there's online, which is so I mean, look. Look, it's just so Are you here? Do you know someone who actually owns an Xbox? Halo 2. I need a weapon right this way. You want it? Tell that to them. They want it. End of story. I just can't stop playing Halo 2. It's like we were made for each other. Morgan, if you love Halo 2 so much, why don't you marry it? Unfortunately, 11 states voted against it. I guess my love of Master Chief will just have to remain illegal in Oregon. You know, whether you believe in a higher power or in nothing but the inky blackness of your own meaningless existence, we'll have exciting PS2 reviews for you when we come back. Oh, Adam, do you like my sweater? It makes me want to gouge my eyes out with a pen knife. Oh. Coming up, stuff your stocking with Games of Goodwill on the PS2. Once again, two people roasting on an open fire. Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. I got that Michael Powell something to thank him for keeping the airways nice and bland. So sweet. Oh, oh, it's you. Please, join us. We were just about to stuff our stockings with love for all mankind. Welcome back to our non-denominational gift guide. We're showing you all the games you should be buying for that special gamer in your life. Let's see. I bought gifts for all the friends on my online list. I got things for Adam underscore Sessler, Mally's, Obvious Plant 65, oh, and F***head 2000. How is F***head doing? He's doing great. You know, good friends always warm the cockles of my heart, and we have something That'll warm your cockles, too. Yes, like a rich cornucopia stuffed oh. with violent content, the PS2 has more swell games than we know what to do with. So no matter what your special gamer is into, we've got something for him. Or her. <laughs> we sure ho-ho-ho you like them. Oh. Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. Take the fanboy staple and put a higher number on it, and you have a recipe for saliva-drenched desire. But beyond sycophancy, there's a pretty darn interesting game here. It's a prequel, so it answers many questions and offers up some truly meticulous gameplay. Many more aspects of stealth and covert militarism come into play here. Camo, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and sustenance. As for the patient and fans of the series, but well worth it. Katamari Damashi is, simply put, unlike anything else. Yeah, it's Japanese weird, but it's good Japanese weird. Tactically inventive and deceptively simple, this is one of the year's biggest surprises and is shockingly compulsive. Even if you're not a gamer, this one's gonna get anyone interested. Plus, it's 20 bucks. What more do you need? Ratchet & Clank Up Your Arsenal is easily the best game of its type since the last Ratchet & Clank. Part platformer, part action game, it's fast-paced, elegantly designed, and an absolute pleasure to play. But it is dangerously addictive. 
It might look youth-oriented, but the rioting is for an older base, and the fun can be enjoyed by everyone but those who cry during Gilmore Girls. It's near perfect and highly satisfying. Okay, so you're thinking about getting Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Question is, are they mature looking enough to get away with playing it? Are they able to tolerate a moral spin cycle as you eradicate cops, pedestrians, and drug dealers? Does any type of music from the early 90s make them feel pleasant? Do they know anything about the game? Does this look fun to you or your gift receiver? Do they own a PS2? Well then, get the game. You know, nothing compliments a quiet, snowy night filled with the smell of cinnamon and evergreens like the sight of a man shooting people to death. I like that Katamari Damashi. It's perfect for everyone in your life, from the stoners to the ravers to the kindergartners. Don't go away. When we come back, we have a hearth full of mirth and merriment waiting for you. But right now, I'm going to light the menorah. Oh, Adam, a lightsaber will only cauterize those candles. That's why the bleeding arm scene in the cantina scene of Star Wars Episode Four breaks with continuity. We're nerds, aren't we? And complete tools, too. <sighs> Up next, what could be more PC than a non-denominational holiday show? Why, PC games, of course. Seriously, who bogarted the eggnog? It's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Oh, I love it this time of year when the fresh snow softly dapples our shoulders. Get out of the shot! Out! Get out! Oh. Welcome back to X Play's non denominational holiday gift guide. We're back to show you the best games for all your favorite consoles. And we're filled with all the spirits of the season. Eggnog, plum wine, mm. cooking cherry. Mm. It's times like these that you want to surround yourself with family. Friends. And heartwarming things like Grand Theft Auto, Halo 2, and that game where you knock people's heads off with a shovel. It was banned in Australia. Oh. And speaking of Australia, a shout out to all the Aboriginal viewers out there. Tis the season to enjoy your tribal gods. Hey, it is. Mm. You know, on these cold winter nights, I like to curl up next to a warm PC. And if you do too, maybe you should buy one of these games. Remember The Sims, or as I like to call it, the land of never-ending expansion packs? Well, it did end to make way for the beautifully refurbished Sims 2. It's still the same game at heart, but now it's 3D. So now all the hijinks, ribaldry, and intestinal evacuation is more fluidly animated, allowing the little avatars to make a better case for unemployment. If you know a Sims fan and their PC can handle the processing heft, go right ahead and let them lose their life through others. Total War series has always been impressive in its ambitions, but faltered in the execution. Spirits of the dead cry out for blood. This is so not the case with Rome Total War. The turn-based section of the game can indulge the budding Caligulas with politics and taxes. The real-time section is an amazing depiction of the immensity of Roman-era battles. Complex, but accessible. Pretty much, you just have to like togas. There is no shame! And someone better like furry-footed emotional halflings to appreciate battle for Middle-earth. Two campaigns, one good, one evil, offers both intimate bloodletting and full-scale orc eviscerating carnage. From the makers of Command & Conquer Generals, the game has a good pedigree to make it a fine capper to four years of indulgence in Peter Jackson's cacophonous gay fantasia. But what might be on the minds of most PC gamers capitalizing on the holidays for material acquisitions is Half-Life 2. Your hour has come again. Lightning has struck twice, and this is the amazing follow-up to one of the greatest games ever. Beautiful, creepy, and sublimely designed, once they can manage to install it, you are sure to hear thank you. No. 
Some people think that wearing these tiny antlers must be emasculating, but they're wrong, aren't they? Of course they are. It's the sweater that makes you look gay. Coming up, multi-platform games to fill you with joy and empty your bank account. Deck the Halls with Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Welcome back. We were just curling up in front of the fire. Isn't that right, little bear? Morgan, that bear can't talk. He's dead, just like me on the inside. Oh, I guess it is dead. Sorry, pagans. We killed your nature. You know, I know we come from different backgrounds. And we all believe in different things. Mm -hmm. But there's one thing above all else that unites us at this time of the year. Multi-platform games. Yes, for once, Jews and Gentiles, Republicans and Democrats, PS2 and Xbox owners can all unite over one thing. Good games and the joy they bring us. So come closer. No. Closer still, not that close. And enjoy these special multi-platform games from us to you. It's only been a year and our sash-wearing, sand monster-slaying hero is back. And he's gotten a little grim. Prince of Persia, Warrior Within, takes last year's exceptional title and refines it to make a game that focuses more on combat and integrated puzzles. This little romp through Kurdistan future is significantly more violent. The infinitesimal percentage of kiddies who picked up last year's copy may be an inappropriate audience. But the more sophisticated gamer in your life may appreciate this little number that's sure to get lost in the GTA Halo Half-Life hoopla. Beautiful Joe 2 is now out for both the PS2 and the GameCube, making last year's triumph of originality immediately available for more people. We're back! Maybe not a good idea for those sycophants of hype, this is a great one for the connoisseur who's willing to step up to the challenge the game throws down. Plus, it's not just a retread of last year's number. There's new special moves and a whole new character. Trust us, this is a winner. Cut, cut, cut. Def Jam Fight for New York is our favorite of the new fighters because it's just so over the top. Fast paced and visually satisfying for the pain junkies, this game dishes out bare knuckled mayhem and pulls no punches. The special someone getting this better like profanity, hip hop, and sadism. When it comes to sports games, the distinction quality between Electronic Arts and ESPN is highly debatable. He made a great tackle there. What's not a point of contention is price. Sega's ESPN titles come in at $20, making buying multiple games much easier, which would be much appreciated by the sports gamer relying on you to keep him lost in a vicarious fantasy of athleticism. But if you want no holds barred endless fun in a world of carnage and shameless destruction, Burnout 3 is a winner, even if you come out the loser. This racing game puts the emphasis on playing dirty with glorious disregard for public safety or moral instruction. Ram opponents off the road or just try to create a smash up that even Interstate 5 couldn't handle. The game keeps on giving with so much depth and casual fun that even the most uptight DMV official will secretly love it. All that destruction just makes me cherish the beauty in this world. The beauty of good games, good friends, and good times. Cheers to that. Are you drinking gas? Maybe. Hmm. From all of us to all of you, happy non-denominational winter season. Non-denominational non winter season. Scion, featuring the all-new XA and XB, customized to your individual style.
Jamie Lesko. In my new book, we'll tell you how to tell bill collectors to go shove it. My new book shows you 4,000 government programs that you can use to pay your bills and get out of debt forever. Get $2,000 to pay your rent or mortgage. Or $600 to pay your phone bill. Or even $7,000 to pay your credit card bills. I've been researching government grants for over 25 years, and government officials don't even know about these programs. And you've never seen a book that's so easy to use. Here's a program to pay for your prescription drug bills, or a program to pay for your living expenses, or programs to pay for your housing bills, apartment bills, or even your student loans. Over 80% of the people in the United States, including millionaires, are eligible. Isn't it about time you get rid of your debt once and for all? If you don't use these programs, somebody else will. So call now and get free money to pay your bill. Call 1-800-615-0202 now. Is your holiday just not performing? Then get G4's Holiday Joy. Now with Christmas Day Marathon. 15 hours of G4's biggest events and specials of the year, starting at 11 a.m. This thing is going off. Watch out, incoming! It's awesome. It'll make you feel all tingly and jingly. Ah! That's good. Now move it. The Holiday Joy Christmas Day Marathon starts Christmas Day at 11 a.m. I'd like an Atari 2600 system, please, and everything that goes with everything. You sure you want everything? I want everything. I'm putting you low price up to thirty dollars a rebate offer. That's free tax. Is that everything? It's not everything. You can get nearly three hundred different cartridges. Three hundred. That's not think something. But it's not everything. Uh, Soon there'll be a voice module, a trackball, remote control joystick, and the computer keyboard. It's board. amazing. It's amazing, but it's not everything. It's not everything. Soon there'll be educational games too. Is that everything? That's everything. For now. For now. The Atari 2600. Now get up to thirty dollars in rebate offers plus a free Pac-Man. Really She's the most exciting woman I ever met. Yeah? Atari introduces a woman of the year, Miss Pac-Man. Just like the arcade classic, four different game screens, floating fruit, even pretzels. hear this other guy talk about his realistic home video football game. Well, I play real football, and I also play the new Atari real sports football, and I love it, because I love real passing, real kicking, and especially sacking the quarterback all by myself. 
then who are you going to listen to? Some guy who just talks football? Or a nice guy like me who plays it? New Real Sports Football, one in a series, only from Atari. Unknown sectors, blast Klingons, raise your shields, watch for space mines. Is this the most challenging game in the galaxy? It's inhuman. Star Trek from Sega. created the toughest game for Atari's video system.
If you've got the guts, we've got the game. Chopper Command by Activision for the Atari Video Computer System. Come in, fire it! Give it! Look out! Watch your radar! Retreat! You've been got the guts! Forget your own game. Chopper Command by Activision. Nobody compares to Atari. Excuse me. Have you compared them to Intellivision? Intellivision? Sure, they've got great space games, like Intellivision Space Battle. I didn't know. And now there's Space Armada and the Incredible Astro Smash. I didn't know. Here, compare for yourself. Intellivision Space Games from Mattel Electronics. Once you compare, you'll know. I know, you think you're going to be the one person in the world who can't operate a computer. You think you won't even be able to hook it up and it'll sit on your shelf mocking you. Well, this is how easy it is to get started with the new Atari XL home computer. Once you get the whole system set up, there are over 2,000 things you can do with it. Just plug this into here. Very easy, because there's only one place it goes, and there, you're ready to go. 26 seconds. I can go again. I can do it much faster. Go again. Let's go again. Presents Mega Mania, a new video game for your Atari video computer. Oh, Mega Mania! Mega Mania! This is Pitfall, the smash hit, the smash hit video game by Activision that everybody wants for the Atari video computer system. With scorpions, tar pits, and rolling logs. With, uh, uh with underground passages and cobra rattlers. With, ah, uh, with swamps, hungry crocodiles, and lots more. Don't miss Pitfall, the smash hit that everybody wants. Get it before they're all gone. Pitfall, designed by David Crane. Don't miss it.
million. Now the video game Munchman. Yeah. And I see you shot down two billion aliens from the planet Mongo. Yeah. You are good at computer games. So what do you know about computers? If you're going to spend your time playing video games, why not play them on something that can also teach you about computing? Get a Commodore 64 or Vic 20. It's tough to grow up in a computer age without learning about computers. Missile Command. With an Atari 400 home computer, there are a world of possibilities. In fact, it could even change your life. The Atari 400 home computer. Presents its newest star. Vanguard. Just like your arcade thick zone. Let me show them the mountain zone. Hey, check it out. Get the energy pods. So long, Harley Rocket. Hey, the rainbow zone is my turn. You can shoot in four directions. All right. I'll just freeze to the stripe zone. The wall. The wall. Yeah. But tell us, who destroys the gun? Luther, Luther destroys, destroys the gun. gun. <laughs> Vanguard is here, only from Atari. greatest arcade video games are now the world's greatest home video games. They're only from Atari, and only for systems from Atari, which means that when you play them on an Atari home video game system, you'll see amazing graphics, like this, thrilling action, like this. It also means that if you try to play them on anything but an Atari system, you'll see something like this. Experience near ColecoVision, and we bring the arcade experience home. 
with arcade graphics like Donkey Kong with multiple screens, just like the arcade game, arcade controls, and ColecoVision is an expandable system. Plug in the first expansion module and play all Atari VCS compatible cartridges, more arcade games than any other video system. Now, bring the arcade experience home because your vision is our vision. ColecoVision. If you think ColecoVision plays all Atari cartridges... You mean it can't? Here's Pac-Man on ColecoVision. But here's Pac-Man on the Atari 5200 Super System. Now you're talking. And it doesn't work on ColecoVision. But won't Jungle Hunt? Not with real arcade graphics. Miss Pac-Man? This Miz plays only on the Atari 5200 Super System. And now there's an adapter. For 2600 games? Nearly 32600 games. Super. System. Now with a $30 rebate. And Pac-Man from Atari. Once you use invisibility, you can't go back. I was tired of pounding buttons. Winning is what counts. Is playing it straight more fun? They don't know, don't hurt them. You know who doesn't do it? Everybody does it. Losers. I do it because I want to win. Guilty? Sure. But I'd do it again. I'd do it again a lot. Get the latest cheat codes and walk through strategies for Halo 2. Defend this station. I'm the weapon. You'll never be stuck again. Cheat with Kristen Holt. Tuesday night at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. This week on the show, we're talking to the people behind the suffering. And we're talking about Ninja Gaiden. I think it's a little too hard. Oh, sorry, I'm late. I just beat Ninja Gaiden. What the hell is going on? Eugenio show host and for six years I've been doing this show and for six years so I wanted to have a real article genuine double rectified busted thank you John thank you. I've wanted to have the courage to wear this shirt and this is my last chance so I'm gonna wear it right. what do you think you like it uh-huh yeehaw <laughs> that's what I call courage there's old paint in the back there right yeah there's some string hanging but that's all right <laughs> what the heck is that I... uh, huh. <laughs> That's the problem with this shirt. Yeah. It gets all tangled up and stuff. Only one thing hotter than a geek, and that's a cowboy. <laughs> you like cowboys? Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know if this actually makes me a cowboy. <laughs> hey, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. I'm Leo Laporte, and this is, yes, the last call for help show. But, uh, boy, we're going to have a good time today. I'm so glad you're here. Throughout the show, you're going to see, you know, this show, uh, of course, I've been doing this, and, uh, and, and we've had many hosts, of course, Kat and... Uh, and Phil Allingham and Becky Worley and uh, Scott Harriet and of course Chris Perillo for a long time and, and Silicon Alley who sat in that seat for a long time uh, that you're sitting in, Cat. A lot of people have been on the show, but what you don't see as often is the, is, is the people behind the scenes. So throughout the show, we're going to give you a little peek at some of the people who bring you call for help every single day. The people behind the cameras who are so very important to this show. And uh, just as a way of acknowledging the work they've done for the past six years. Whew. Now, if you have a question for us at Call for Help, you know, we've got that email form, techtv.com slash call for help. I don't think anyone's going to respond, but you, <laughs> you're welcome to put a question there. <laughs> Force a habit. Uh, you know what? I'm going to come in, and I'm going to check the email every day. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm going to come in and sit at my little sure. keyboard. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I like that shirt you're wearing. Is that an Thanks. official Call for Help yes, t-shirt? Yes, it is. That's the new one? I kind of blend in here, but yeah, this is the new one. We have lots to give away. <laughs> Just in time. We're going to give yeah. them away today? Send, them your, send us your address, and we're going to send out oh, that's nice. some shirts. Yeah. That's good. Anybody this wants is the one. girl tee. It's long sleeve, if you They're can't really tell. They're really nice. Yeah. yeah, I like them. Hey, good show today. Jim Hyde is here. We love Jim. He's been on the show many times before. He's the author of Sell It on eBay. He's going to show you how to take, edit, and post better photos for online auctions. Get more money for the stuff you sell on eBay, so you're going to want to stick around for that. That's what we do. It's what we've been doing for six years, is help you use the technology to make your life a little better, make a little bit more money. 
Plus, websites come and go. Cat has a way you can look back at old pages. It's an internet time machine. I want to show you something, Cat. That just as an example. Okay. We get mail all the time. I get lots of wonderful email. Occasionally, I get some uh, regular old-fashioned mail. This came to me from uh, a fellow who's graduating from Pedro Menendez High School okay. in Jacksonville, Florida. All Adam right. Christopher Jackson, and he just. You know, I don't know Adam, uh -huh. and he just decided to send us an invitation Aww. to his and high school those, graduation. You only get like six of them. That's just really sweet. So, where is it? It's in Jacksonville. You know, I'm oh. not going to be doing anything, so maybe I'll go. Oh my gosh, you would make his day. May 22nd. I think I could make that. That's that tomorrow. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the kind of, I, <laughs> me and old paint be coming out there in Jacksonville. No, that's the kind of thing that I just, I love that. And yeah. it's one of the things that really makes doing this show so great, is that people consider us part of their family. Yes, they do. And isn't that sweet? So thank you uh, for inviting us uh, to your graduation. I don't know if Kat's going to be there, no. Adam, but I will. Okay. Yeah. No, just, I don't know. I don't think I can make it. Hey, let's get our first call of the day. Wait, I just uh, want to mention something. There's a rumor yeah. going around that the Swiffer wet jet is killing dogs and animals. And since I invented the Swiffer, I just want to let everyone know that that is a hoax. What is the Swiffer wet jet? Well, it's this thing that collects dust and dirt on a long pole, and now they have them that actually squirt water. And I invented the dry one when I was an intern a couple years ago, and this is the new version of it. You invented it? Yeah, I invented the Swiffer. Wait a minute. You invented it? Yes, I invented the Swiffer. I was so an intern. You, you didn't tell me that you're independently Dude. wealthy. Well, no, I didn't get I didn't get any money for it because I was an intern, and so I was in a brainstorming meeting. That's where I came up you're with the idea. Me. And as I was an in, being an intern, you have to sign away all your ideas. How, and how many years I've been working with you? I don't know, four. I never knew. The year after I had the idea in the meeting, it was on the market. The Swiffer, and then, but the wet jet was somebody else. The wet jet else. is new, and they're saying and that's it's the one that's people, killing dogs. It's, a, it's an urban legend. I, I'm oh, okay. doing research, <laughs> so I'm not killing she's anyone. The, she's defending not her. Not a killer. That's like the Steve Martin in the, in the Jerk. He invents that glasses push-up right, thing. Right, right, right. The Great. Optigrab. Yeah, makes a lot, makes him a lot of money, and then <laughs> yeah, it okay. turns out it makes everybody cross-eyed. Yeah, like this, they're like, uh huh. Swiffer wet jet. Are you pulling my leg I'm now? I'm not. I invented the Swiffer. I'm not kidding. You're Let's take a call. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if we can Tony get any from than that, Milwaukee, but... Wisconsin. Do you believe me? Uh, yes. There yeah. You go. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. Whatever you say, Cat. I did. Hey, Tony. How are you? Good. Welcome to the show. What can I do for you today? Uh, on my Microsoft Word, there's symbols in between words, and uh, I hate it when that happens. At the end of paragraphs, and uh, yeah. And you don't want to see those anymore, do you? No, I'd like to give them away. So. So uh, let's let's activate this later. See, one of these days we're going to have to pay for this program. Okay, this is <laughs> this is that's how many years has that been asking us to activate it? Microsoft Word. Okay, this is another line. Now that's what you want to see. You just want to see your plain text with all your stuff. But what you happen to be seeing on there is something a little bit more complicated. You see all these weird symbols, right? Yes. I hate that. I wish there were some way to just to kind of get get rid of all those you know, weird symbols so that you'd never see them again. That would be so cool. Now I can't find out how I did it. <laughs> it was here a second ago. I just turned them just on. think about it. There it is. It's this little, it's this little symbol here. What? Whoa, hey, whoa, hey, whoa, hey. So on your toolbar, and this is probably what happens, you accidentally clicked it. On your toolbar is a little uh, paragraph marker. That's what that is. And it turns on what they call invisibles. So the invisibles in this case are a dot for every space, that paragraph marker for every new line, and there's a few other invisibles that might show up. There's another way you could turn it off, of course, in the uh, view and, the, uh, and so forth. But, the, but your toolbar will have this little paragraph marker, and that's what I would do. And that, that's handy to turn on if you're, for a couple of reasons. One is if you're kind of curious, well, do I have a lot of spaces in here and stuff? Because their spaces are invisible. Another one is because the formatting for a paragraph is actually stored in that paragraph marker. So if you can see it and copy it, you can actually apply that paragraph formatting to other paragraphs as well. So that's kind of a handy thing to know about. But normally you don't want to see that because it's very distracting. So that's how you turn it off. Just click that funny looking backwards P on your toolbar there. All right? All right, thank you. See, it's just that simple. Thank you for calling. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. All right. Coming up next, we're going to head back to the phones. I want to take another call for help and a whole lot more. You stay right here now, partner. Jim and Bill in the, in the shading there, as usual, reading a book instead of, no, Jim and Bill are great. Love them. And as we went into the commercial, the folks upstairs in Master Control, they're the people who really kind of keep this whole thing running. Without Master Control, we wouldn't even be on the air. They're the ones who say, 
Tell Leo he's out of time. Go in the black. Hey, brain. <laughs> Change jobs with this button head. That guy. That guy. So throughout the show, you'll see some of the people behind the scenes. How many people do you think, Steve Porter, it takes to do this show behind the scenes? It's probably 20 or 30 people working. A uh, camera and microphones and everywhere. I mean, just a lot of people. You know, Cat yeah. and I and Roger and Ian are kind of in front of the cameras. So many people behind the scenes. Good people, too. Mm -hmm. Let's jump uh, into another call. Who's on the line here? Okay, Ken? Leo. On the line is Kevin from Kingsport, Tennis Kingsport, Tennessee. Kingsport. Hi, Kevin. It's either Kingsport King's or Port. King Sport. Kings. Hello, Kevin. How are you? Doing good. How are you, sir? I'm very well. How do you like my shirt? Well, you can't see it, can you? But it's beautiful. Let me just tell I'm you. I'm sure it's... it is. <laughs> what can I do for you? Uh, I have Windows XP running on my computer. Okay. And it's a uh, version of the computer itself. is a used computer. Okay. I purchased. And yeah. It's listing another administrator, and I do not have a password for the administrator. Ooh. I want to know what I would need to do. So when you log in, you're not an administrator? No, sir. I can log in as a user, but not as an administrator. Uh, that's kind of a problem, isn't it? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, because you can't create another administrator account, and you can't administer the computer, which means you cannot, for instance, install software, kind of important right. things like that. In some cases, uh, you can't even update the antivirus or run Windows Update. So we've that's got to, exactly right. That's yeah, exactly right. We've got to get you in there. You're, that computer really isn't usable. So if you can't go back to the original owner and find out, did they give you a, an install disk? Uh, no, sir. No. no so sir. You, you basically, you don't have anything. Well, it's a little tricky, but there are ways to crack the Windows XP password. I'm afraid that's what you've got to do. I mean, the ideal thing to do here would be to reinstall XP. Uh, but since you don't, uh, we're going we're gonna to point you to an article that the lovely and talented Kevin Rose, your namesake, wrote on cracking XP passwords. I'm going to show okay. you a little trick that's very handy in Google for finding stuff like that. I'm going to say right. sitetechtv.com, and I'm going to say Kevin Rose, and then I'm going to say uh, crack XP password. And then I think Google will probably get us the, yeah, there we go, right at the top, number one. This is Kevin Rose's ultimate password recovery guide. And he has a link to a number of programs in here for getting the password. Now. I have to say, it's not, it's not going to be a, an easy thing to do, but there is one program that's a, basically a, a, you actually create a Linux boot disk out of CD, and you okay. boot it, and it will destroy the, basically destroy the password so you can create a new one. Oh, I see. All right, but that's, that's very important. So I'll give you the link to this, and, and you can go to this site. It'll be on our website. That's very important and, and something to keep in mind when you buy a computer. <laughs> it's no good to you if you don't have the actual password to get in there. Right. That's a little. That's a little bit frustrating. It doesn't allow me any control, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really really tricky. If you do the same Google search I did, you'll also come up with a bunch of other articles. Kevin seems to write a lot of articles actually on cracking Windows passwords. <laughs> hmm. I understand. <laughs> Our dark tipper over on the screensavers. So that, we appreciate him. Yeah, there is a yeah, there is a way to do it, and uh, uh, and it, it it's it's not particularly tricky, but you do you will have to read it. This is this is one NT password that will do it. Uh, he's got a lot of different recommendations. I just suggest you read the article rather than me going into great detail. I also, right, I I'm a little it. hesitant to because at the same time I don't want to uh, tell people how to get into other people's computers. Uh, I certainly understand. But I know you have a good and real reason why you want to get in that one because it's yours. Yes, sir. <laughs> good luck, I appreciate Kevin. your time, sir. Oh, nothing, nothing better to do than talk to you. I'd love that. Thanks All for right. the call. Okay, Kevin? Take care. Take care. Coming up next, hey, there may be no free lunch. There isn't any free lunch, you know, I asked. But there is our free file of the day. It's still ahead on Call for Help Tips for Better Photos Online for your online uh, auction listings from our uh, own eBay expert, Jim Hyde. You stay right here. Take care. Screensavers. It's our last day here at Call for Help after six wonderful years, and uh, they very kindly gave us a chance to put some final words of wisdom on the website, so we invite you to go to techtv.com slash call for help to read our goodbyes, and everybody is going to tell you where you can catch their stuff and what their website is and, and all that stuff. Everybody's going to have a chance to be up there, so including George, the series producer, Crow. Where's your picture, George? And Dan, the line producer, Mitchell. It's been a great six years. Say goodbye online at techtv.com slash 
call for help. Now, let's jump right into a live call. Who do we have well, on the I'm line here? I'm looking for that. I want to see. I'll find it in a second. It's oh, under about us. I'm sorry. Oh, I should have told you. Under about us. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Done. Oh, it's, it's not up yet. It'll be up soon. Yeah. yeah. Well, when the show airs. On the phone, it's Brandon from Silver Creek, Georgia. Hi, Brandon. How you doing? Hi, Leo. I'm doing fine. How are you? Oh, I'm doing very well. Oh, look, I got a pop-up. What's your IQ? Smart enough to close you. <laughs> Can, what? What? Okay. Go ahead, Brandon. <laughs> I had a little pop-up moment. What can I do for you today? Okay, uh, I've been getting a dangerously low resources message about drive D, and I was wondering if I could reallocate memory from drive C to D. Uh, yeah, you can. So you're getting a message saying you're running out of room on drive D? Exactly. Yeah. Now, one thing to do is, of course, see if you can uh, rearrange a little bit. But if you have to, if, you, if you've decided, well, I cannot get rid of anything more, I've got to have some more room, I want to, and C has some space, you can modify the partitioning, but I'll tell you, you can't do it with anything free. You're going to have to spend some money to do it. You need a program called Partition Magic. Have you ever heard us talk about that? I've heard about it before. Yeah. It's, from a, it's actually from Symantec. They bought PowerQuest, the companies that made it. I wonder if I can still go to PowerQuest and, uh, and find it. Uh, it's about 79 bucks, and uh, what it allows you to do, it's, a, it's what we call a non-destructive partitioning program. So what it allows you to do is resize partitions, and that's your problem. You've got well, now, I'm, I'm, I, wait a minute, I made an assumption here. Do you have two hard drives or a single hard drive divided into C and D? It's a single hard drive. Okay, divided good. Into C &D. Yeah, there's nothing I can do about it if you have two different hard drives. But if you have one hard drive that has been partitioned, that is, and as we were talking about before, divided into logical, imaginary drives of, of C and D, you can rearrange how big those are. But to do it without destroying the data on them, you have to use a non-destructive partitioner. Partition Magic's my favorite one. It's from Symantec. I'm not going to get the site that way, I guess. Uh, I was going to the old PowerQuest site. Let's see if I can find it at Symantec. Yeah, see, I think PowerQuest site went out of business. Symantec.com is the company that bought them up. If you go to products, you'll be able to find it. It's Partition Magic is the name of the product, OK? All right. I'll find it here somewhere. Well, well you, you get the idea. Here is uh, da, da, da. I would say that's probably Enterprise Products and Services. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, and I do. I love the program. The problem is, of course, it's not. It's expensive, and so if you're only going to use it once, is it worth it? Uh, I don't know. It's up. To, it's up to you. Thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Now it's time for cats clicks. This is so weird. It's the last one. The hmm. last one. Strange. If you're sad about this. Don't be too sad because there's a way that you can check on our website for years to come if for some reason something happens to it or you can't find something. This is what you're going to do. You're going to go over to the archive.org. It's actually just archive.org. And here is where you're going to find archives of all different things online, including 10,000 live concerts online, all kinds of vintage software, all kinds of images. Tons and tons and tons of information is archived on this website, including the Wayback Machine. This is pretty cool. In the Wayback Machine, enter in the website that you're interested in looking way back to, like techtv.com slash call for help. And it gives you a page like this. And we see here that it gives us four years of information. Now, they are going to update it again soon, so there will be a 2004 on here. Click on any one of the dates, and you're going to get an archive. Look at this old archive page of Becky. There she her. is. Yeah, hot mama. Yeah, yeah. Hot mama. Here's Alice. Silicon Alley, yeah. So you can see George that the, uh, the website <laughs> goes far back. Here we've got, a <laughs> we've got some Perilla Who's that guy? action here. Who's that guy? Yes. And um, sometimes the, the links don't click all the way through, but a lot of times they do. And you'll be able to find stories from a long time ago, and you can actually read the information. Here's you, Leo. Here you are. Um, I remember me. See. Yeah, thank I used, you. I used to remember me. Hey, you know, you could go even farther back. Yeah, look at oh, this Oh, my one. goodness. That's my old web page back when I had no, no graphic sense whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Look at the spinning okay. globe. That's generic. Yeah. But, um, yeah, mark. this is it. You can go back really, really far. Dan Mitchell, our line producer, pointed out you can go even farther back if you use ZDTV.com. Oh, right. That I would take you back even that. better, even past 19, when did we change the name? 1999, um, 2000? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. One thing. Look that at that. I, yeah. Oh. 1998. Oh, let's see what we have Jeez. in 1998. Uh, there's a segment that we didn't get to do because of the show ending from this website called Ultimate Ears that actually makes customized earphones. Those I got are them. cool. They're pretty cool. Check them out, Ultim Ultimate Ears. I wanted to because they, they made me a pair and they were going to make you a pair and everything. They pour, a, they make a mold from yeah. your ear. They pour a thing in your ear and you go. 
like this little goo, and they. But whoosh. you see the, all the These rock are stars. These monitors. You see the rock stars using them. Right. Uh, it, it's a monitor. It seals the sound. Yeah. They're really cool. Yeah. I'm jealous. And they come in this case. Check this out. And they're about what? $3,000? They're like 500 bucks. They are wow. extremely high end. Well, good headphones are very, very Here's expensive. Here's ZDTV. It's coming up. Oh, look at that. It's like taking a long time because it has to go so far back. The web archive's a neat idea. It was a... Uh, New um, viruses use porn as lure. Imagine that. No. Could shocking. You imagine? Shocking. <laughs> look at this. This Sexy is so funny. Sexy soap. Ooh. The good old days. Learn how to Thank make you, Kat. We're still doing that. The Internet Wayback Machine. AOL 5.0. Yeah. Yeah, check it out. All the details are on our website, techtv.com slash call for help. Send me an email, cat at techtv.com. For people who don't know, that, that was the old network was ZDTV. Yeah, ZDTV. Okay, Sports lady, I love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh. <laughs> Coming up next. <laughs> oh, is that the last That's cat's sweet. click ever? I don't know. <laughs> no. I gotta tell you something, Kat Schwartz is gonna be here for a long oh, yeah. time to come. She's not going anywhere. Coming up next, Jim Hyde, the author of Sell It on eBay, has tips for better online auction photos. You stick around. Dymo saves you Tymo. Wow, what a move. Welcome back. It's time for the Wire World Challenge. And for that, ladies and gentlemen, Greg Tremelling on, on Jib. And for that, we're going to need a contestant on the line. Yes, and hopefully. it's not going to be Greg, although yeah. Greg is one of the guys who's betting all the time on the contestants. Yes, we know they that. Do. Yeah, they're throwing money in. The who's on the line, Kat? <laughs> well, hopefully these questions won't be as hard as they were yesterday. I got a tough one. I got a, yeah, well, okay. Okay, yeah. on the line, it's Krista from Bellevue, Nebraska. Christina, how are you? Good. Good to talk to you. You too. You may be our very last Wired World contestant, but to, to do that, you got to get this right. Hope so. I'm going to give you four categories. You pick a category. I'll give you a question from that category. Get it right in 15 seconds or less. You get a chance at the big board. 25 fabulous prizes. Okay. All yours. You get to pick something from it. Here are the categories. Listen carefully, Tina. Okay. Scrub and Scour, Power Player. Don't pick that one. Trip the Light Fantastic and Writing on the Wall. Scrub and Scour, Trip the Light Fantastic and Writing on the Wall. Um... We'll go with writing on the wall. Right. Good choice. <laughs> what input device is most often used with a digitizing tablet or touch screen? What do they call that pen-like device you use on a tablet? A uh, stylus. A stylus! <laughs> Woo! Congratulations. Pick a number from 1 to 25. Make it a good one, Christina. Uh, we'll go with number 9. No. Who's that? <laughs> number 9. It's Pinnacle Studio 8 for Pinnacle Systems. Yay! Congratulations, Christina. That's a nice product. You're going to love that. It's my favorite video editor for Windows. Pinnacle Systems knows how to make it right. What? Pinnacle Systems knows how to make it right, and you are a big winner. Thank you, Christina, for playing our game. What? Thank you. What the? <laughs> now let's take another caller who's on the line here, Kat. That was awesome. That's Maddie back there. Oh, yeah. On the line, it's Chris from Benton, Arkansas. Hey, Chris. How are you? I'm good. How are you? We're very good. How are you? I, I keep saying, how are you twice? I don't know why that is. I'm on a, I'm a broken record. What can I do for you today? Yes, um, I have a question about my hard drive. Yes, sir. How can I change from FAT32 to NTFS without losing any data? Oh, you know, uh, are, so you're using Windows XP? Yes, sir. Okay. FAT32 is the old style file system for Windows 95 and 98 and ME. And when you go to NT based versions of Windows, which means Windows NT, 2000 or XP, their file system is called NTFS, NT file system, get it? And uh, it is a little superior. The yeah. only reason you want to keep FAT32 is if you had to do it for compatibility. If you were still running Windows 98 on a partition or something, you want to... That's, that's what I was doing. I had booted Windows 98, and I got rid of it. Right. I didn't need it no more. So you don't have it anymore? No. Go to NTFS. It's built into XP. It's very simple. You go to Start, Run. You type CMD to get a command line up. Okay, and the program, it comes with XT, is called convert. Now, if you do convert slash question mark, it'll show you the various parameters for this. What you're going to probably, I mean, pretty straightforward do is convert the name of the drive, if it's the C drive, C colon, and then you do slash FS file system, and you say, I want that file system to be NTFS. All right. And that's all there is to it. There are some additional uh, parameters. I've never seen anybody use them. <laughs> so really, the ones you want to use are convert, 
the name of the drive, slash FS NTFS. You hit return, it'll run. It'll do the conversion in place. You won't lose any data. Uh, although, as always, when you're doing something like this, there is some risk if the power went out or whatever. So it's a good idea to back up before you do it. All right. But that'll do it for you. All right. Thank you. Hey, I thank you for the call. All right. All right. All right. I think that was our last caller. All right. I think it is. Chris, you are our last caller on Call for Help. You have one more chance, my friends, to take the daily quiz. Head to the website, and I mean it when I say one more chance. Click on the quiz link. If you give us the right answer, the Tech TV t-shirt, that brand new Call for Help shirt could be yours. Our question of the day. Who was the very first Call for Help caller back on May 11th, 1998? Captain Kangaroo, Pat Boone, John C. Dvorak, or my mom? Get to the website, give us the answer. We'll talk about it when Call for Help continues. T. Today, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, on the screensaver. Before the break, we asked you, who was the very first caller on our very first Call for Help episode? Call for Help episode. That was May 11th, 1998. It was my mom. The first time we've ever had the D answer be correct. <laughs> it was my mom, and it was by accident. She had dialed in. We had we were going to take another caller, and they punched up the wrong no, no, button because we didn't know how to work anything. Yeah. <laughs> and I said hello, and she said, "It's your mom." Oh, I love it. She said, "Mom." It's perfect. <laughs> it was it was a good way actually to start uh, all those years ago. I guess we shouldn't do a coming up on tomorrow's show, uh, should we? No. no. So let's uh, take a look at the email. Okay. Then. I I know that you guys are going to be keeping in touch with us through your blogs. How yes. do I get a blog? Oh, blogs are great. Now, there's a couple of ways to do it. Blogger.com is, is a really good way to do it. Google owns them now, and so you know they're going to be around for a while. And that's absolutely free. Very good service. Live Journal is also free. You don't have to get an invite anymore to do a live journal. Uh -huh. I think that's a good choice. Uh, of course, there's uh, people who use commercial services. I use TypePad. Right. You can do that for free, but you probably want to pay 5 10 15 bucks for uh, the more elaborate service. Uh, movable type is the software version to. of that. Use movable type. Yeah. But that requires that you have some expertise uh, modifying your website and, and, and so forth and so on. I think probably the best one is blogger.com. I, I think that's a kind of a default these days, yeah, don't you think? Yeah, they make it really easy to set up the template to customize Couldn't it however easier. you want. Yeah. It's, it's a my nice first, site, it's free. My first blog was on blogger.com. Yeah. And you use movable type, which also yeah. is a great program. Right, and we will be keeping in touch with people through our Catschwartz.com. Yeah. You're not going to go anywhere, right? You have a future on this channel, well, I think. Well, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> She's so cagey. So. You do, I promise you. Okay. Well, let's get one more email We're going to make you sign something saying that. Yeah. Um, what are these home servers everybody's are talking about? This is a very popular category right now, but it is kind of confusing. It basically is a little computer, but it's a headless computer. No keyboard, no monitor, just the computer and the hard drive. And you can use it for backup or storing your media on. It's, it's sometimes called a media server or a file server. Uh, you know, the truth is I wouldn't run out and buy one, but you'll know when you need one, when you want to start combining uh, the data from a bunch of computers or maybe have a lot of video that you save and, and store out uh, across the mm -hmm. network, things like that. It's kind of a more advanced thing, but I think more and more you're going to see these. I do not. I don't. No. You're going to get one? No, oh. not yet. Someday. Hey, Kat, oh, yeah. it's been a real pleasure working okay. with you. We, uh, we are at our last episode of Call for Help, six years uh, after starting this, May 11th, 1998. It's been a great journey. We, uh, we thank you so much. It is a real honor and a privilege to get a chance to come into your home every day. And we have loved every single minute of it. Yes. I think I, I don't have to, no. I know I'm speaking for you and everybody else on call. Come on over here, Roger and, and Ian, yeah. everybody else who's on uh, Call for Help. It has been so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> And to all the people who have been on Call for Help over the years, Becky Worley, you come up here. Woo! Phil Allingham, you come up. Come on, Becky. Oh, the people who have hosted the show, Scott Harriet's not here. Yay. couldn't be here. Chris Perillo's not here. And everybody else who's been a part of this show, we have loved doing it. We are not saying goodbye just until we meet again. I think we'll be on the air somewhere someday. I'm Leo Laporte. Remember, if you've got a problem with your personal confuser, don't whine, don't moan, don't moan.